Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and welcome to episode 165 of Defining Duke, a multi platform podcast. Cog, how are you today, my good friend? We, you know what? I'm looking at our show notes. Just a word of warning to the audience it is full of write ins. Very little news this week. We have a quiet, quiet week this time. We've settled finally. Yes. So, again, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. I mean, just been running around like crazy, you know, sort of personal life. I've been running around and the career life I'm running around. Mm. And then, um, yeah, as far as the physical uh, dukes, get your blood work done. Get your blood work done. Got some latest updates. Everything is trending the right way. Minus one thing that I was I was oh. scolded on. Oh, so, no. yeah. So basically, I'll give you the real short of it is that, um, you know, part of my workout routine, I know I think we have some questions in there in reference to that, is, um, you know, I've been like a, a creatine guy. I used to be, you know, a creatine guy, loading phase, all that stuff. Sure. So they were like, yeah, um, it's a little high, not, 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 past normal but the high range of normal mm. and you want to bring that down because that helps with better kidney function getting stuff out the body kidneys Got are it. important so i was yeah. like well you know what let's not even play around with that let's just throw all this creatine in the garbage yeah. <laughs> and let's get out of that so yeah. i don't want to play around as i get older you know promoting better kidney health right. and all that stuff gets the toxins out the body and stuff like that and i've been really good with my water so but other than that they love my blood work so guys get your blood work because it really it's like your, your your little system maintenance of what's going on you know yeah. get that up-to-date stuff so stuff yeah, you I was can't see that. You that's what it is feel. Yeah. absolutely but the sodium's down sugar levels down nice. so they were just like all right just work on this and the blood pressure a little bit and do a little bit more exercise and we should be better yeah i actually have a physical scheduled for uh next month so nice i'll be getting a nice checkup blood work piss test all that fun stuff yeah and, you know, yep, seeing, same thing. seeing how we're doing so mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone take care of yourselves. In fact, you, you mentioned the write-in, so we'll hop yeah. we'll to it now. You can write in over at patreon.com slash Media, like Walt Chambers did. Whoa. Greetings, Elf Warrior Maddie and Dwarf Warrior Cog. By the way, Walt, it's Elf Archer Maddie. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know you're a listener. You know this well. You guys get to correct me. I'm going to correct <laughs> you. This is how it works. It's a two-way street here. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, seriously, no. Walt writes in. Hope you're both conquering the day, Maddie. After the Peloton saga and your leap into weight training, I'm curious, what's holding you back from teaming up with an online coach or pro trainer like Lord Cognito did? With your history of a serious back injury, your training approach seems like it should be more than just easing into it. Crafting a spreadsheet of exercises is a solid start, but isn't there a more structured, scientifically sound way to gain strength without fear of re-injury? What if seeking an expert, just like you did after getting injured, could transform your resilience ensuring your injury proof is it a bit of ego thinking you could tackle this solo many listeners might be in a similar boat looping through this process of setbacks instead of following a strategic rpg like progression path i'd like to hear your thoughts on seeking guidance to avoid making fitness our final fantasy instead make it our rebirth i love that very crafty right in here uh just to to answer real quickly it's definitely not ego i i have like the the most like when I say minuscule Jimmy go like it's not yeah. really existent for me like I'm not coming in there like I know everything uh, I'm definitely educated I'd say in the space but I still get a, a little bit like fragile when I've like I it's because I hadn't done weight trading in over a year and a half and I'm I, I've moved since then so mm-hmm. going into a new gym I don't know where everything is and I'm walking oh, around yeah. just like skinny as I'm like oh, what <laughs> There's a bicep machine. I'm just walking around like that dork. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, or at least that's how I feel. I'm walking around like, so yeah, there's that factor. Mm-hmm. You, I get over that pretty quickly though. But now it's, it's more like I've done a lot of work with doctors and physical therapists leading into this mm-hmm. and have been educated on what types of exercises I should and shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a degree like right now I'm, I'm still going to the gym and there's a degree of, um, you know, machines that I, I miss, things I want to do, 
that I know won't be smart. Um, and I'm, I'm learning to work around that, but I'm really trying to listen to my body and what they had, they had told me, which is like hinging exercises. No, anything gotcha. with like upper above your head. No. Ooh. So like triceps, triceps are a little tricky. Like I, I got to, instead of what I used to do at the gym, which let me get through my workouts a little quicker. It's like, Oh, someone's got the rope pulled down. I'm going to go yeah. take a dumbbell, go over the head right. and just work it that way. It's like, no, I can't. Cause that's, that's a, a weight coming up of my head and it's pushing down on my lower back. I have a slip disc. And so mm. even after physical therapy, it's good, but like you yeah. cannot compress that. Can't press and that, no. so, yeah, I just have to make sure anything that is not going above my head and coming down. So I have to be really, Getting careful that even with like incline stuff so that's kind of how i was educated and mm-hmm. when i went to one physical therapist who was helping me work my lower back to strengthen it again um he had almost re-injured me so i oh, learned no. there in real time i was like okay certain types of squatting exercises that put that pressure down also can do the trick so i've learned through both almost a re-injury and through other professionals who helped me after that near re-injury mm-hmm what I can and can't do. So uh, definitely no ego, just more so like trust in the process and kind of having a different demeanor. You know, when I was first strength training, I was tired Mm. of, you know, being like really thin. I was like, all right, I just want to bulk up. And I did that pretty successfully. Uh, But then I got hurt in the process. Uh, This time it's more just like, I wear really baggy clothes there. I don't Mm. wear stuff that like shows off my body just because Mm. I want to focus on me. If that makes sense, as in just I'm doing it for me. I'm not doing right. it to to even look good. Like it's just I want to to focus on strengthening my body because you can feel it. Like mm-hmm. the difference between say last week and this week is immense. Not just progress wise already, but how I feel yeah, physically. It's part. like oh, and I was yeah. really weak. I was mm-hmm. really weak, and uh, that may have contributed to other ailments that I was going yeah. through. That I I had like my swings kind of decreased. Since I've asked about my core a lot because yeah. there's stability there. It's not like it's just a hunk of organs and I'm just like hunched over like a goblin at the computer. So it's just all in my neck muscles. It's like you fix your posture, you strengthen your core muscles, your chest a little bit. It's like, okay, I'm starting to feel more stability. I haven't felt in a while. Um, same with my legs. So yeah, it's um it's stuff that I'm just learning on the fly. So yeah, that's why I'm doing it. That's how I'm doing it. And uh hopefully anyone who's stuck in that loop, yeah. I mean, it, Walt is right, you you know. Definitely yeah. want to listen to professionals. Cog, you've Absolutely. had a, a trainer though in the yeah. past. How'd that go? Yeah, yeah. I actually um shout out to Walt because um he he's he's in the DMs a lot. Apologize, brother. I know he. I get a thousand DMs and a lot of times he, he probably leaves messages and I haven't probably still got back to a bunch of them because he's he does his own program. I believe it's called like Infinite Health or Infinite something like that. He's really cool. I called Adam on recently. Um, as oh well. really? Nice. Yeah, he was on uh, Second Service Plus. Um, cool. after I think um when me and Colin did a uh, our health is wealth episode. He and another gentleman, I believe, was on as well. So, yeah, we'll be doing his thing. He's big in the community. He kind of gamifies things, which is really cool and fun. And he's got a a program. So you should check it out. You should definitely check it out. Um, Yeah, as far as that, yeah, I think for me is I needed to recenter because, like, when I first started, very first started working out, yes, went, got a, you know, trainer, went to, like, a New York sports club, you know, started to learn. And then after a while, after about six months to a year, I'm like, okay, I kind of got this. I can do this on my own. I have a structure of what I want to do and what my particular goals were. Mm-hmm. And then I think to me, it's like every two or three years for me, this is the way my body is. I do seek out like a trainer and then recenter. So last year was kind of, I said, you know what? It's been a long time. I got new goals now. Body's in a different place. I'm older now. Let me, you know, seek someone out. So, um, yeah, I, I, I linked up with this cat and, he, he's official, man. He's putting me through it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> then after that, after about uh, then six months again, I'm like, all right, I'm good. I'm in my pocket as far as what I want to do. But my main thing at this stage is you're an older lifter, an older workout, is all about injury avoidance. Yeah. Honest body assessments when you can and you cannot go as far as limits, right? Because yeah. I think younger cog so bro you gotta push through bro you gotta you know what i'm saying like you gotta get that gain you gotta get that extra pump you gotta get that lactic acid and all that and a lot of times older cog is like okay you're working hard but if you continue your body's like may do a little funny reaction and you go oh, stop yeah it, yep. it, it, it ain't like that whatever it was it didn't like that and that happened to me on squats 
Mm. And I was like, okay, lower back, something's going on there. Let's not do our heavy free weighted squats, squats, squats like we used to do. Do some alternatives, get the back checked out because it was like a little nerve thing going on. Mm. So I was like, yeah. gotta be careful. So the, the key thing for us older OGs, older dukes of the realm, listen to your body because the worst thing you could do is try to push through, try to be tough. And you get a serious injury, yeah. and that's that's not what I'm about. So yeah, that's I, uh, what I'm doing I hurt my shoulder in college from, from mm. trying to do that kind of energy. It's actually never really been the same since. It's like right back here, it just mm. rotate it, a cuff. It, it, yeah, almost. They just get mm. sore compared to my right shoulder. Way easier. Yeah. So like on shoulder days, I was like feeling it in one arm, and I was feeling it in the right places in the other. But like there was one part of my shoulder is just you can tell. Yeah, yeah, definitely like the weak link of my body for sure. And, that's and that was point. from me yeah. trying to do a crazy fucking lat pull down when I was 18. So don't make that mistake. It's not, it's just not yeah. worth it. It's just not. Yeah. yeah. And to add on to your point, when that happens, then you have to have the discernment. Okay. A couple more weeks. It's still not, not yet. No shoulders for, you know what I'm saying? For a while yeah. until you get back and then ease your way back in. It's, a yeah. lot of this is ego and paying attention. Yeah. And time, you know, yeah. I, I, that's the, the difference is like when I was bulking, I mean, I put on a decent amount of weight in like three months and I was really filling out and it's it's paid off long term. Like I've looked and felt healthier because of that. But I, like I'm just taking the slow approach. Like if I'm more cut in a year from now or it's six months or it's two years. Great. Like I don't I don't know. Like I don't care is, is probably yeah. the best way to put it. It's like I'm, pocket, just here, yeah. I'm just here to stay in shape and just make yes. sure I'm doing the right things because like I have that true mentality now. Of like we always joke about like for the games man but it's like yeah. yeah i'm working more than ever we're ramping up in some ways behind the mm -hmm. scenes i'm really excited about it. it's like i need mm -hmm. to be on my a game just making sure i'm doing body maintenance like i Facts. just need to be moving my legs every day which yep. i do struggle with but um i definitely need to be at least get into the gym and lifting a little bit and just Absolutely. keeping the muscles and the more so the joints man yeah joints. The, the, the stiffness that oh. that's in there like my elbows were sore because mm -hmm. like I haven't done those sorts of like curls in a while. And so, um, again, you just realize like how good this can be for you once. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's, it's easy to forget when you're away. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Health is wealth, everyone. You already know. All right. We have a few. We have a ton of write-ins this episode, but we have a few others before we begin. Trill Spencer writes in. <laughs> I like that name. <laughs> Salutations, <laughs> Lord Cogmito and Mr. Meaty sure. Plays. First time, long time, writing in to follow up on last episode's brief Shin Megami Tensei discussion. Maddie, when you mentioned your experience with SMT4 Apocalypse, I became concerned that you may have made a grave mistake. I did some digging on Retro Rebound and my worst fears seem to have been confirmed. You played SMT4 Apocalypse without playing the original SMT4. Correct uh -oh. me if I'm wrong, but it seems that you were under the impression that Apocalypse is the royal version of SMT4. I must inform you that it is absolutely not the case. In fact, Apocalypse is a sequel of sorts and an entirely different game. It also happens to be the most hated and divisive SMT game. <laughs> On the other hand, the original SMT4 released in 2013 for the 3DS features some of the greatest story, setting, atmosphere, combat, and music that I've ever experienced in a video game. Maddie is a viewer since 2016 who has never commented or written in before. By the way, how do you do that? That's crazy, but thank you. That's what's up. I implore you to play the original SMT4 and go in blind. You owe it to yourself to write this wrong and experience some of the finest JRPG greatness available, stay meaty. Thank you, Trill, for writing in. You are correct on your assumption, by the way. This mm -hmm. is what happened, and I, I remember the Retro Rebound comments on that video. It was one of those, it's the worst feeling as a content creator where you make this like irredeemable, dumbass mistake is what I call it. Like You were just an idiot for it, where I'm like, Oh, it's not like Royal. It's oh, oh it's a sequel. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah, was... uh, I still have critiques that I give like, oh, would I have liked it more? Hearing that it's more divisive makes me feel a little better, Trill. But okay. yeah, that that was one of those hard. I remember reading those comments. Is that heart singing like, oh, no, I'm so dumb. Like, how did I do that? How did I go through a 40, 50 hour game and just not know that, man? Oh. But awful yeah, feeling because atlas is known for doing the re-releases and so i knew there's smt4 then there's apocalypse i was like oh yeah like apocalypse is persona 5 royal persona 4 golden it's an innocent mistake i think but i shouldn't have assumed that's my own oh, fault good. we learned we learned yeah we learned. but i've been doing my research on smt5 vengeance and that game mm -hmm. like some of the stuff they're saying about it with the new monsters a new scaling new story it sounds mm -hmm. way like that is seemingly at least the uh persona 5 royal if you will for gotcha. smt5 
Uh, and it looks and sounds great from what we're getting thus far. Uh, but don't worry, Trill Spencer, I, I will write this wrong. I actually have Devil Summoner. You can write it again. I, I know it'll be your second time. You'll be breaking a bad habit here. But let me know what you think of Devil Summoner, because I have that on 3DS. That was going to be the next one, but should I go to SMT4 next? You let me know. I sometimes peruse the comments, but best way to, to make sure I see it is through the Patreon write-in. So thank you, Trill. Hello. All right, Cog. This one is going to celebrate us a little bit. Dylan Moore writes, Howdy Dukes. How does it feel that you got the biggest shout outs for best gaming podcast in the Game Awards Twitter thread? It's awesome to see you guys have this kind of reach. And I hope it continues growing. Did you did you catch this by chance? I did, because what it was is like um, my notifications were just going off. And normally, you know, I just mute if it, it gets too crazy. But I was like, what is this in reference to? And I keep seeing Define Duke, Maddie by far, Maddie and Cog by far. I was like, what is going on? LSM love by far. So I'm like, OK. And I was checking it out. I was like, yo. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So it looks like the Game Awards Twitter account put something out. What's the podcast you listen to? And the community showed out for us, man. I, that was super dope. And you really appreciate it. Like, again, as content creators, you know, not that, you know, we got to have our ego stroked all the time, but we work hard. And, and it, it does feel good to get any type of acknowledgement on the on the biggest level, because obviously we know that their platform is pretty big. So, yeah, salute to everybody who who actually took the time out their day to, to get the Dukes some yeah. love, man. I love what we're doing. So, yeah, that, that <laughs> felt good. Yeah, it was it was amazing, really, because I know technically I think our audience would consider us like the rogues of the industry in the sense that, you know, we're finding great success, but we're definitely not in the mainstream pocket. And so to see sort of a, a question, a question that brought in so many people like unsolicited, just like pouring out love across all of LSM, not just Duke, but yeah. Sacred, oh, yeah. punching up, you know, just a lot mm -hmm. of love for what we do here. Yeah. um incredible it really was and so we're just very thankful that our audience is willing to to speak out and support us like that because it shows that you know uh, again I, I really have said this a couple of times so i'm gonna make this last time i say it but i really look at that conversation we had when there was that big question mark surrounding xbox and we got together with the sacred boys and i'm like we absolutely were leaders there in that conversation absolutely and I'm just happy to see the recognition across the entire company. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just sacred, which it mm -hmm. could definitely be. And I'd understand, but it's Oops. good to see that each of the shows was getting a ton yeah. of shout outs um, because that just, I think, shows the overall strength of the conversations that we have here. And uh, it Absolutely. made me really happy to see the community showing out like that. So thank you to anyone who just threw our name in that thread, uh, whether it was ours or another show. We just appreciate the love you have for we do here on LSM because we yeah. love it too. Super dope. Got a couple of corrections here. Not much love. Haven Breithaupt writes in, Hey Dukes, got a bit of a correction from last week when you were talking about the Nintendo Direct. Cog mentioned a game he was interested in but couldn't remember the name. It's a 2D Metroidvania game called Ender Magnolia Bloom in the Mist and it's a sequel to Ender Lily's Quietus of the Night it's available on Xbox. It's really good. So I hope Cog checks it out. My buddy also played this one. He really likes it. I own it on Switch, but I've I've not played it. So Cog, hopefully that yeah. answers the gap in memory there. Yeah. Haven, man. Shout, shout out, man. Helping out the old Duke <laughs> with the memory. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nah, because I looked at it. I was like, man, that looks so cool. And I, mm -hmm. I like the idea of uh, like when you're fighting these enemies, the art style look cool, but when you fight these enemies, you can then beat them and they become your companions that fight alongside you as the game goes on. Yeah. I was like, yo, what's this? Yeah. So yeah, I got to check out Edna Lily's name. So if Ender Lilies also has that mechanic, then I'm definitely going to be interested. It does. Mm -hmm. It, it seems okay. kind of similar, but yeah, Ender Lilies is uh, apparently really good. So mm -hmm. I feel like you might dig it. Yeah. It seemed like one of them little artsy farty cog joints. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to check this out. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah I think you like it. Yep. All right. Alex dies twice. You are the last writer for a little bit here. He writes, hello, Dukes. Hope you're having a great day today. I got to respectfully push back on a statement. Maddie said recently, quote, when we all play, we all win, end quote has been the marketing slogan for the accessibility push that Xbox started with the accessibility controller alongside their crossplay efforts. It hasn't been used by Phil Spencer or other official Xbox communication in regards to exclusives in gaming, as you can see throughout the following examples. This once again is another clear example of messaging where Xbox goes on an official communication and pundits and commentators twist it into whatever they want to talk about and support the points that have nothing to do with the original statement. And so... Uh, this is true. I don't know if it came across like I was denying all of that. There were a couple of people who wrote in that it's been a slogan for accessibility for a while. And it was more so, at least what I was getting at is the warping of that to now fit 
a completely different change in how they approach the market because of the companies that they have bought. So hopefully yeah. that makes more sense. It is a fair pushback, but hopefully my yeah. rationale makes more sense with that in how I think they are twisting their slogan mm -hmm. from what it was, which was, you know, hey, here's this very great accessibility controller and it, this slogan works for this. And now it's about why we're breaking down these walls when I don't know if they had full control of that situation, if that right. was really the original plan okay. after they bought Activision Blizzard. And how it's just the business has radically changed. It was funny as I lose track of the of the marketing beat sometimes. So um, for them, especially, they got a lot of yeah, stuff. They, they have a lot, right? So yeah. I remember that. I remember no console requirement. When I told you I went to the Forza Motorsport event yeah. and I saw that, I was like, hmm, interesting kind of thing. And then as far as the everyone plays, we all win. You know, I do remember at the very beginning because of uh, so Solomon Romney, the person who helped um, with the di uh, disabled uh, gamer who helped give his input with the design of the adaptive controller. And I was super proud of that interview. I think it's like E3 2018. So it mm -hmm. is interesting because it, it's funny because in your defense, it it feels like that uh, marketing beat, is it feels like it's part of the, hey, we're breaking the walls down kind of yeah. thing too. So I could probably find myself guilty of doing that same thing as well. But sure. uh, no, good point. Good point. I think it's It's, it's smart. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I'm not saying they're they're devilish yeah. for it, but it's, it's definitely twisting what it was right. originally for into something right. else. Yeah. Right. So and again, it's all about inclusion. So I yeah. get it. <laughs> I get it. So someone in the boardroom was like, ah, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, Cog, we have a little bit of news to get into today before we probably have an extensive uh, write in section again. So let's keep it rocking here. The first bit of news that we've got has to do with the Xbox Series X. And according to Xputer, who, by the way, reported correctly the release date for Hellblade 2, Senua Saga, says that an all-digital white Series X is in development with a release plan for June or July. So, Cog, what are your thoughts on the big man getting the little man treatment? <laughs> yeah, this feels like um, one of those Xbox game showcase you know, launch drops right then and there. Mm. You know, Phil comes on stage. Remember, same thing with Series S. We didn't think we were going to get a black Series S with a little bit more storage, right? Mm. So it, this feels like one of those announcements right at the summer, right when you're there, and it comes out. I still think, if I had to guess, that uh, code name, I think Brooklyn, the one that's the spherical, yeah. all digital, I think that probably will still come, maybe hopefully uh, later in the year. They seem you very You think bullish. that's the end of the year one Sarah Bond was yeah. talking about? Yeah. I, I feel so. Because I feel like they're, they're going to want to, obviously, components will be minimized. They're going to go away from the physical disc aspect. And um, yeah, I, 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 that's my guess. I still think those slides we saw, I mean, controller, those were. <laughs> those are the most official go. yeah <laughs> like documents that should not have been out out kind of thing so i think those are still on track but yeah this yeah. makes sense this is one of those e3 by the way mm -hmm. right now it means you know, they gotta have something that they think they're gonna show kind of like with starfield where a little bit of an attachment to it right you have to little, think at least yeah, if they're gonna repeat a past marketing play yeah. And I'm curious about storage. If they if they do anything with storage like they did with mm. the Black Series S, I'm very curious about that. Because you don't hope so, right? Because it's all digital, so it's got to be more than. Yeah. And those, uh, those unless you want to get one of those memory cards that are like three hundred dollars. Yeah, and I'm trying to say cheat them a pro proprietary well, um, joint. So we'll see. But yeah, I think that's what that is. Yeah, so we'll keep an eye out. This could also get announced ahead of the showcase, right? Uh, but we'll, we'll see what they end up doing. Mm -hmm. All right, Kai, we got another one here. Age of Mythology Retold. This is a 2012 strategy game. It's getting remastered with an upgraded engine by World's Edge, uh, new character models, animations, etc. And it's coming to Xbox Game Pass this year. So for those of you who are Age of fans, you've got this one here in the wheelhouse upcoming. So keep an eye out. Kai, any thoughts? On Age of Mythology retold. Just world ed edge, world's edge of them dudes. When it comes to that real time strategy, when it comes to PC, and then now you know bringing these big games into Game Pass, these are huge. And when I speak to, I remember a couple of my colleagues at Meta at the time, and we kind of get an idea of what type of games they're playing. They're like, bro, they into these RTS is hardcore. Yeah. All you would hear about is age and all that stuff. So there's a huge demographic. Also, I feel like European as well. That is um very much bigger than those games, China and stuff like that. They they're bigger in markets than we than we think, mm. as opposed to the United. That's what I learned about. It. I was like, damn, I thought ain't nobody don't play those. Nah, people play. <laughs> so I was schooled. Like, yeah. I, trust me, I've been learning a lot, man. I've been learning a lot. Shout out to um Genki who we had on um 
recently. Actually, shout out to Dustin who had Genki on also. On, I saw that. Um, yeah. Right. And then it just so happened the timing that we scheduled him on around the same week, way, way in advance. So he was giving us education as far as how the Japanese market and the games that they actually like and the things that we think are big here are really niche titles in these other regions. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was really eye opening to learn this stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So Age of Mythology coming to Game Pass this year. Keep an eye out on that one. Next up, we've got High on Life. This is getting uh, a limited run as well. Um, so go ahead and check that out. I believe pre-orders will be live. I can check right now in real time in a moment. But um, yeah, Limited Run Games is doing this just like they're doing it for Pentiment, just like they're doing it for uh, Hi-Fi Rush. And now High on Life is also getting. So that's a third Xbox, you know, digital only title that's that's going physical through Limited Run Games. And uh, Limited Run is eating pretty friggin' well, right? It is available for pre-order right now. They have, looking at their website, Contra, you got Pentiment, King of Fighters, you got uh, Shantae, which is a, a pretty niche one, but mm-hmm. one that collectors really gravitate mm-hmm. toward. I mean, there's a ton of uh, big properties. Like, they obviously do Star Wars. Like, they do a lot of stuff there, and uh, their their business has grown an immense amount here, but uh, they will be handling high, high on Life. It is available for PS5. It is available for Series X. Uh, it's 50 bucks if you want just the box copy. There is a collector's edition. I'm looking at it right now. And it comes with <laughs> it comes with Thunderbuck too. It comes with a knife. It comes with <sighs> I believe that is it. Yeah, an art book, soundtrack, a little squeaky toy looking thing, some stickers. It comes with a decent amount of stuff. Not their most popping collector's mm-hmm. edition. I will be grabbing the physical of this for um for Xbox. I bought the Pentiment one for Switch. Ah, um, you yeah. have the Pentiment joy. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Gotta oh, support man. my man Sawyer. That's Sawyer. Dope, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he Slow. he deserves it. But uh um, see, you see the retweet uh, 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 uh the Duke uh, interview that we did with us? Oh, did he retweet it? Bro, he retweeted it. Oh, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. He, he saw he showed love. Because I was very proud of that interview we did. And I felt like it should have been bigger than what it was. And, I agree. Nah, it was, it's, it's doing its thing. People, I agree. Are, people are really getting onto it now. Yeah, no, 100%. And so mm-hmm. please listen to that if you have yet to. Pentiment yes. is fantastic. And, and just to be able to crawl around the mind, Josh Sawyer. He had another great string of tweets. He was talking about uh, developers reusing assets. And someone had called out that From Software is still using the same, it's a small thing, I guess, at the end of the day, but they're using the same door opening animation that I think was in Demon Souls. And, and Josh is like, yeah, this is what you all, we need to do more of this. Like we are not going to, you just can't reinvent everything nowadays. And so mm-hmm. I think that's why FromSoft is just able to get away with and do so much because they reuse in such a smart way. And I, th- I think that's a lot of what game development's about. So yeah. yeah, shout out to Sawyer, but yeah, uh, high on life, limited run, COG. Mm-hmm. Interested in this at all? Is it going to get added to the back, the box stack behind you? <laughs> nah. <laughs> but I like, I mean, high life is cool. It's fun. You know, so I, I didn't, it didn't have, it was one of those joints that's like when the joke you hear it that one time you laugh, but after multiple times I'm like, all right, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? It's one of them games. It's shock value as soon as you go in and I'm having a good time, but it's not a joint I'm going back to like that. So yeah, it didn't have that stay in power. For yeah, me. I, I was, wasn't super in love with the game, but mm-hmm. enough to get it physically. But I wasn't in love with it enough where I was like mm-hmm. really praising. It was funny, but yeah, it, it was funny, but it was. Like, remember, it took off. Though. It took off. So cool to the, right. salute to the people who. You know, who definitely uh, yeah. supported it and, and want to get a physical copy for themselves. So. Yeah, this should do well for them. Actually, I think we have news here. Speaking of Squanch games, oh. we'll just move this one up because it's a little organic. Let me copy and paste it here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Xbox has hired Squanch, Squanch Games co-founder Tenya Watson to join the Xbox Game Studios leadership team. So uh, this is a a pretty significant deal, if you will. Um, mm. That number one, she's she's exited that position, but also that. She's sticking with Xbox here. Um, so, Cog, what do you make of this? Because one thing we talked about with High on Life is how when it was such a tremendous success that that relationship should remain as close as possible. Even if we we're sitting here saying like, yeah, we weren't too in love with it. But like you look at the numbers it did, probably what it did for Game Pass, biggest third party day, uh, one Game Pass game. And so it looks like they're they're keeping things close here. Come on, join the join the leadership team for Xbox Game Studios, a first party family. So uh, what do you make of Tanya Watson joining? Xbox Game Studios. 
This is news to me. I missed this completely. Um, mm. Yeah, she pretty much made the statement that she's thrilled to share that she's joined the team. They're challenging times for the industry. Feel incredibly fortunate to have opportunity to contribute to such important studios. Mm. Yeah, I don't know what to make of it. It's it's interesting because to go from yeah. from Squanch to this executive role is a big deal. I'm trying to get a look at um you know her history as far as like pasting that she she has done, but um yeah, I mean clearly they they they're interested. It's a it's a big get them but i'm curious to see like specifically what her role is okay executive advisor board member wow this is a big deal yeah it's yeah. leadership team this is a big deal this is and i'm trying to see past history okay so she's done okay she was on board of directors at, at squanch at squanch she was the advisory board she was also ceo and president of bad robot games wow so she's she's had some uh, extensive experience yeah. there yeah. yeah. So I'm, it's I'm one of those things. It's a little yeah. bit of a deeper cut bit of, bit of news mm-hmm. there, but just I always think it's noteworthy because you see with moves like these, like when we saw I apologize, I'm forgetting her name, but Xbox hired someone who had a lot of relations for PlayStation in Japan. Mina, and then she, Mina Kato. Yes, thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. And when she was brought over, she's been very vocal and active in trying to establish that connection. We've seen certain supporting moves. To suggest that so i always like to just track who's in and out of these bigger positions because there's usually a very deliberate reason for their addition not always but still something worth tracking to see what the ripple effect is beyond yeah. that so yeah don't want to make too big of a deal of it here but yeah tenya watson co-founder of squanch games who's the developer of high on life uh, mm-hmm. has joined xbox game studios leadership team well i like this sentence and i'll conclude with this in her uh, about I have a proven track record with over 20 years of game industry experience. I have a proven track record of leading and growing teams, delivering high quality games and launching new IPs. Core competencies are Unreal Engine, AAA game development, studio management, executive level production, and new IP development. Sounds like something Xbox could use. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah. you know, help my, my booty the team out. You well, know, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm for that. <laughs> so clearly she, she, yeah. she knocked them out. She knocked them out in them interview. So salute her. Perfect. All right, next up here, Third Kind Games. You may not have heard of them, but you know what you've heard of? Fable. And guess who's co-developing Fable? Third Kind Games. Apparently, it says in their past portfolio that they had helped with the performance of Forza Horizon 4. So they've worked with Playground Games in the past. They're co-developing Fable. This is something Matt Booty has spoken about in the past, how Every game needs a co-developer is sort of his, mon- his mantra. Um, he's, he established this statement with Crystal Dynamics helping out the initiative, saying this is how games are made nowadays. You kind of have like the workhorse and the ideator. And so it seems like with Fable, things are moving along enough here where a co-developer has been attached to it. Now, I've learned the hard way to not get too carried away with co-developers because in some instances like fallout 76, you see now the fruition of a cold a co-developer and what that's done for the game and how it's contents coming out and the quality of it. But then I think of like KOTOR remake and I'm like, Oh, they brought saber as a right, co-developer right, right. for aspire. Like this is perfect. You got the workhorse who just does magical shit on performance and stuff. And then you got the new guys who are passionate about the IP and we know how that's going right now. So I don't always get too carried away from that traumatic experience, but (laughs) Fable as a co-developer, Cog, your thoughts on the matter. It'll be interesting to see, you know, the trends in development. And I think for me, where I know some people are are conversations I've had with people behind the scenes. Some people are, I don't say they're critical of Matt Booty, but they want to see, they want to see, how you know these games pan out and it's just a big year you know especially with fable the following year most likely right so every interview i've seen from him he's been extremely bullish about it he's been you know wanting them to show more you know i love what i saw you know last year you know at the at the direct and stuff like that so i mean um at the showcase so yeah i think as far as code development this could be a trend in, in gaming you know this could be where you know, teams come out and experience teams like that helped out of Forza Horizon uh, 4. I mean, a tremendous track record. That was a high quality bar game. Hey, all hands on deck, as long as it's not interfering with the core mission of Fable. And we don't have, you know, the situation that Maddie mentioned before. Hopefully that's a one off <laughs> situation that had other factors to deal with that. But yeah, this sounds um pretty cool to me. I, my, my thing is, and speaking with Matt Booty in the past, I just want to see, to me, he's under the gun as far as the quality of these games that come out. 
Because mm-hmm. to me, that cla- I call it the class of 2018, right? You know, all that stuff that we've seen, now we're going to be getting. We're going to be getting the Hellblaze, the Avows, the Fables, and let's see now. And I think that's where mm-hmm. his greatness will be judged if whether or not these approaches are, are sound and correct. Yeah, I was just scrolling through their portfolio a little bit. In 2022, uh, they helped Blizzard bring mercenaries to Hearthstone. Mm-hmm. A brand new shop, which they created Hello. from the ground up. Wow. Uh, legendary Hearthstone characters. They did a client client and server work uh, for predecessor. It says here, sorry, the trailer just started blaring my ears. Um, <laughs> it says here that they worked on localization, frame rate optimization, submission compliance, which is task slash bug fixing to be mm. compliant with Sony and Microsoft's certification tests. They also worked on publishing support, like tool support, achievement support. Mm console specific features um and so with fable here there is no word of what they did at all it just says explore a land of fantastical creatures and wondrous places announced in july 2020 and currently in development fable is a new beginning to the legendary franchise what i noticed here um is that really between fable uh and its main developer and now the co-developer i'm not seeing a lot of a ton of RPG pedigree. I know they hired some Witcher talent and whatnot. I know there's some OG line head devs there, but it's just something mm-hmm. to monitor mm-hmm. and engage on like how they're going to be handling the RPG elements right. in this game. So I could see it being a full fledged action game and the RPG elements are more fleshed out in like the, uh, the, the story choices and the, and the, the morality of them, which I think would be really fitting for fable. That'd mm-hmm. be more connected with fable one, in my opinion, which is right, my personal right. favorite. But just something to keep an eye on. I don't want to judge too harshly based on a co-developer, but again, something yeah, to no. just keep in the back of the head. I mean, I think it's valid because of what, you know, obviously Playground, their history, right, has yeah. really been card games, right? So I think that it's something to, to pay attention to. I'm, I'm also of the, the mindset that, you know, sometimes we can't peg developers because I remember, you know, before, what is it, before Horizon Zero Dawn came out, what was it, Gorilla? they were doing like, was it kill zones and, mm. and all that other stuff? So it, it is interesting, but it's, yeah. it's valid to say, okay, let's see how you do outside your genre. Like to me, that's when you get into special like yeah. category. And I think of like Respawn when they just jump into a whole new genre. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I wanted them. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's Obsidian to me. It's one of them. Like, okay, yeah. you did this. Oh, oh, here's Grounded, by the way. And, and it's hot. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it, it, that's a that's a very unique skill set that everyone can do. So I think it is worth, you know, monitoring. Absolutely. Next up, Cog, we have a, a small little tiff in the Xbox community being patched away soon, but I'm excited to get your thoughts on this. Pentiment was found to be running at 120 FPS on PS5 compared to Xbox's 60 due to a bug, which is to be patched soon and getting the Xbox version Working at 120 FPS, RK128 writes in, Blessed day, Dukes, with the release of Pentiment Digital Foundry pointed out that the game runs at double the frame rate of the Series X version, and while it's stated by Obsidian to be a bug, I can't help but wonder, will other Xbox games run better on PS5? This happened before with Ghostwire, with the PS5 version running for better than the launch of the series release. Am I making a mountain out of a molehill, or is the concern valid? Have a ILP making me wonder if chili dogs are glizzies? Kind of. Hey, yo, R. King, you funny. Shout out to Lords of Game of that Day. Shout out to my man Kelly. He had Lord Sonic in the building. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, man, I'll jump in on this. This is this is definitely going around. Yeah. Obviously, Josh Sawyer jumped on Twitter quickly to address to say that this was a bug. Now, let's be real, y'all. I mean, if Let's just say it wasn't. It was a conspiracy. Theory. <laughs> Do we think Pentiment, the 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 story reading game at 120 frames? I second? was just surprised this was found at all. I, yeah, I, I don't say that it's like in a salty way. I'm just like, why were you guys looking? At why was we doing that? Like, yeah. that, why was we going to that on that level? Like, we were trying to get the perform. We was ready to do digital fraud. and say, yeah, yeah. we got a twenty well, over here. Like, due diligence, and I'm just like, yeah, pentiment. Pentiment. <laughs> I was shocked. On pentiment. I was shocked at this. I was like, okay, this is what we do. But all right, in fairness, if I want to entertain this, because obviously, uh, K is on it. Um, do I do remember with Ghostwire? I will be fair with Ghostwire. I was disappointed that when the port came to Series X member later, at the, at the one year exclusivity was up, there didn't seem to be any type of performance issues, you know, things addressed. So, 
look, is it a concern? I'm not going to go there just yet. I think we're in this new territory of stuff coming to multiple platforms, right? Which mm. PlayStation had to give up their exclusivity once Bethesda got acquired, right? Mm. Now Xbox is changing their strategy and opening it up to multi-platform. And these ports, if I had to guess, they've been cooking for a while, right? They, 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 you'll just wake up one day and it shows up on another platform like this. Yeah. So yeah, it's something to monitor, but I'm not going to get crazy, okay? I, I ain't there just yet. What about yeah. you? Are you are you a little concerned with this? Uh. No, no, not really. I mean, I, I you're asking the wrong guy because like I don't really bitch and moan about frame rate unless it's like jagged and dropping constantly. But, you know, a, 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 a great example of this. I like 60, but a great example of this is playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. That game mm. looks terrible in performance mode. It, mm. it runs totally fine in quality mode. It looks beautiful. Mm. And I didn't even realize until it was like 20 hours of the game. I was like, oh, there is a performance mode. And I turned it. I was like, no. So okay. we're getting to that point where I know Pentiment's not a good example, but we're getting to the point. I look at Starfield. I look at Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Two sides of the spectrum, by the way, an Xbox game and a PlayStation game. And I'm like, I didn't really care about the frame rate in either of these examples where the developer said like, yeah, it's 30, but you kind of don't feel the 30. And I'm like, yeah, you kind of don't. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Again, I, I, I'm not the biggest critic of frame rate because I'm playing these games and I'm just not really caring that they're running smooth for me. They feel good to me. They're reactive enough to me. Like, I don't feel like I'm being bogged down. So it's not that I don't care. But if I were to be like, okay, I, I really am dialing in here. Like Xbox is getting mm. beaten in the frame rate war. Right. Um, I think that would be problematic for them for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And I, I worry about as these Xbox games come over with the PS5 Pro, there is going to be that narrative that Xbox's games run best on PlayStation. And that's not... Well, I don't know if that'll have a ripple effect on sales in the terms of like, you know, really hurting the brand, uh, but it'll definitely be a, a kind of one of those sore spots that keeps getting poked at over time. Absolutely. Like if Starfield, uh, we joked about it on the show, but I think it's possible that whenever Starfield comes over, which I think it will eventually, if that runs better on PlayStation 5 than Series X, that's it's going to be a weird conversation to have. That's going to be think. a conversation. Yeah. Try not to set yourself up for failure, Xbox. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> There's <laughs> no, a no, ring somewhere out there. Tip them <laughs> the leaves. Just try not to step on it. I do agree that that would be out of their control. Like if, if it gets to, like I said, we know a PS5 Pro is coming. I, I look at stuff like that. I look at third party as reference to GTA 6, right? Which yeah. I, I've, I've said on ILP that it would behoove Sony to have some type of marketing or association with that because remember there's no PC release. So yeah. it would be definitively the best, you know, console version to say. But yeah, as far as this other stuff, until I see more of a definitive pattern, I don't pay too much more of this stuff. And again, it's the I care about frame rate, but it's the style of game. Not the yeah. story Bible verse game where <laughs> like come yeah. on with, with Andreas and Mauler and yeah. you know Martin Luther. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's uh I think frame rate matters to me most in shooters. Yes. And like a platinum video game like that yeah. is a, you know, a place where frame rate matters most. But mm -hmm. Pentiment, it could be 20. Yeah. It's a book. <laughs> and they did say it's a bug and the Xbox One is, is still having it. So yeah, it is what it is. All right, Cog, let's move on to a little bit beyond the borders of Xbox here. We're going to talk about TMNT Arcade Wrath of the Mutant. Coming to consoles on April 23rd, 2024 for 30 buckaroos. This is a 2017 arcade game getting i think a couple new stages some voice acting some new moves and game mill entertainment is the ones behind this one <laughs> as they always are with the ninja turtles and uh they'll be re-releasing this one in april so naturally i'm gonna be there and checking this one out because i have to see what's going on i have to be honest mm -hmm. it doesn't look that bad famous last words maybe but it doesn't look that bad it reminds me a bit of cruise and blast I think Ooh. this was also an arcade game, but I love the cruising series on N64 growing up. Like cruising USA, cruising Exotic. Like, yeah. love that. Cruising. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so good, man. I love those games. And so when they did Cruising Blast, I think it was an arcade game that they ported to Switch, and it was a ton of fun. Um, so I am open to TMNT having a little port like this. The thing I worry about is this is more money than our beloved. It's right here oh. next to me here. Shredder's Revenge. This is one of the side scrolling wow. goats, man. Of course. One of the side scrolling goats. So I'll just say be careful with the price you're charging. If you're going to do 30, okay, make it worth it. 
they I, I saw the stage count. I was like, okay, they're unlockables. I'm, I'm a little nervous, man. It looked, mm-hmm. looked like a game mill moment moment in the making. So we'll see, Kai. Any any thoughts on uh, you mm-hmm. know, the MT Arcade coming to consoles? I'm in the middle. Look, of course, I'm always gonna you know champion a new TMNT game coming. I don't know how I feel about this art style. Let me be real with you. It's mm-hmm. it's a little it's a little bespoke. It's different. I don't know. I, I want I, it's it's, it's if the game. Yeah, <laughs> it just look a little jank, a little boxy. They look a little off to me. You know, you know when you buy something from Amazon and you can just tell. I like Amazon a lot, but you can just tell between like the premium brand name and when you got some drop shit, sh- sh- drop shipped shit from Amazon. That's what's happening with TMNT. I we just got drop shipped a TMNT game. That's what's going on right now. That I'm getting the Amazon vibes. It's like, yeah, this is a shelf, but if I bend it a little bit, I'll snap this shelf in half. <laughs> I'm speaking from experience, by the way. Kyle, please continue. A little knockoff energy. <laughs> yeah, bro. Do I have it behind me? I don't have it behind me, but yeah, I, I bought these shelves that are in the corner of this room here to put some of my figures on. And they look the part. Oh man, you look at them, they look the part. But bro, if I go over there and I drop a little elbow drop on them, they're breaking right in half, man. I used that shit for Taekwondo a couple of years ago. It was like little chopping halves, that sort of stuff, man. So yeah, that that that's the the Amazon moment we're getting here. But uh, any any thoughts? I know you were talking about the art style and stuff. Yeah, just I, I gotta say, it just not. I'm not. This is gonna be one of those things that you got to tell me that the gameplay is fire, that it's yeah. fun, and they're doing unique things, and then that'll get me because right now I still feel a little knockoff energy to me, and I just want to. Be sure that the gameplay is tight. But if it's fun, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, we'll see. I'm not holding my breath. All right, let's talk about Persona 3 Reload. We talked about this one already, so this will be pretty brief, but it's just more evidence. Last time we got just a report on this online. Now data miners have discovered inside Persona 3 Reload. Episode I just content, uh, or sorry, files. Uh, for those who don't know, episode I just, it's also called The Answer, which is from Persona 3 FES. It's like the epilogue we were talking about Persona 4 Golden, Persona 5 Royal, like FES was was Persona 3's version of that, which added like 30 hours of mostly dungeon crawling gameplay. Um, and so, yeah, that's been found here in Persona 3 Reload, just adding more evidence to the fact that uh, Persona 3 Reload is going to get uh, the answer mm. added at some point down the line, I imagine. And that that is exciting. That is exciting because I'm curious if they'll change anything at all. I went through it mm. recently and uh, it's on a story front, like not the worst. Like I don't really agree with the mindset that like it's awful. It destroys things. It ruins characters. The music is awesome. Uh, I do worry about them just putting three hours of story with 27 hours of dungeon crawling though. That's a mm. little intense, but because of some of the gameplay changes, like the answer sucked because in FES, you couldn't control your party members. So already Royal has the leg up. You can control your party members so that, you know, we're good on that front. Uh, so we'll see, but the answer is likely en route to persona three reload we'll see when they announce that but just for those of you who are excited for more you can keep an eye out there that's dope man i see y'all going hard for this that's dope man pretty good all right next up here we have ubisoft's skull and bones which they've said has a record player engagement but they have not mentioned sales yet cog how we think this one's doing yeah, <laughs> uh, I am not the person to talk to about this game, bro. Like, I, have I you have played it? Zero interest. I saw Attic play it. I was like, nope. <laughs> I was like, I don't want nothing to do with that. But yep. yeah, good, good for y'all. Record play engagement, but we don't know what it is. <laughs> salute, salute. I hope, hopefully, that worked out for you. <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, the thing also that you know, the game price was at seventy bucks and. You know, they, it had to come out based on the history and stuff like that. Some issues with the, with the, uh, I believe, say the government or something like that. Where, 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 where it was, it was Singapore or wherever it was, they were doing yeah. it. So, yeah, you know, look, you know, all jokes aside, you know, I, I hope so. I hope it, I hope it's successful because I know they've been working on that game for a long time. It just for me, there's it's nothing about that game that's interesting to me. So yeah, I'm good, so, especially <laughs> if you like past piratey Ubisoft efforts. It's just doesn't really add up you know it's like yeah. it's it's as someone who did play it it's just not worth it man it's just not yeah. not for me all right what we have up next here uh we have suicide squad killed the justice league the other triple a live service game that was questionable and so uh, wb has confirmed that 
you know, the, the suspicions of everyone that this game is flopping right now. It's a suicide squad kill. The justice league has fallen short of WB's expectations. They say this sets up a tough year for their games business as it was pretty dependent on this one being a success, which clearly it has not. Uh, the steam player count already tells the story. So I know apparently the, the, the either data mine or the rumor was that they had uh, almost 10 or a little bit over 10 seasons worth of content planned. Oh, wow. And uh, I don't think they're going, I'll double check real quick, but I don't think they are going to get that far cog. So what do you make of Rocksteady and their fall from grace, man? Does this make you worried about a potential closure at some point? If a game that was in development for so long has failed this bad, and there was so much of the game's business dependent on it from WB side of things. Yeah. It makes me concerned about like student, not full on closure, but like, we're in the age of these layoffs, right? We're in the age of uh, reducing and trimming the fat. And, and when things don't perform, there's usually consequences, especially the climate that we're in now. Um, this one is just so polarizing because I do get the sense that from uh, the user review, right, seems to be higher than what the critical acclaim was. But, you know, if the actual company is coming out and say, hey, we didn't meet our expectations, then on a mass level, it just seems that the vibe seems to be consistent from what I hear, which is that, mm-hmm even though people love it, the people that do love it really love it, but people wanted them to go back to their roots. And this necessarily wasn't what they were looking for, for this type of game. So yeah, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. I, I hope they, they don't go under cause they, they have a storied history. You know, these are, yeah. this is Arkham, right? These, these are those guys, rock steady and that. So yeah, it's unfortunate, you know, we'll have to see what happens and hopefully companies kind of ease back with, with with certain catching, trying to catch a wave, catch, trying to catch a trend with certain things. So we'll see if it's a, it's a lesson that they have to learn and apply. I agree. Yeah, it's it's sad to see because, um, you know, I, I feel like this is one of those situations where they probably didn't want to make this type of game and they're going to pay the biggest price for it. I also saw online after the layoffs had happened, which we'll talk about later in this show, that Suicide Squad and, and, and I'm sorry, Rocksteady are hiring at least right now they're hiring. So uh, I don't know what the, the vision is, but they're willing to, to bring more people on the team. And so hopefully it's not, hopefully it's a sign that things aren't going to go awry for them, but I'm not really holding my breath yet. The game unfortunately wasn't what people are looking for. Even if it was, even if that were just the case, it's also just not a very great game. And so, mm. yeah, you said that here we are. You said that. All right, Cog. That's it for the news now. It's time to talk about what games we are playing. As always, Cog, we'd love to hear from you first. So fire away. Yeah, man. So for me, I'm in this weird zone because, like, I finished Infinite Wealth. So my heart wants to go back to Baldur's Gate 3. Mm. But (laughs) there is something that really has my heartstrings and I've been a fan of for so long. And I know this is an Xbox podcast, <laughs> but hey, Square's been talking to Xbox lately. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, let's put some awareness for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Damn it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was, I was been, you know, me and Attic have been talking about this thing for so long. We're huge Final Fantasy VII fans, you know, but got a chance to interview Genki, like I said, who has an interview up on Last Stand Meeting with Dustin. Go check that out, as well as um, our Iron Law podcast interview that with him. And um, yeah, this is such a huge deal. So I've been playing the hell out of the demo, you know, mm. and, um, I, you know, fortunately, I wasn't able to get the code <laughs> like uh, some Are people, but but I was really happy, man. I was really happy with going back to the classic scene, I believe it was in Abelheim and, you know, the, 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 the storied history between Cloud, Sephiroth, mm. you know, Zach and all that stuff. And we living it and seeing what they did. Shut up. I'm sorry. I apologize. I got some very angry okay, truckers right I can, now. I can barely hear it. If okay, cool. Because like, it's loud on my side. So, um, yeah, so pretty much with that, you know, kind of getting back into that universe, seeing where they're going with this very ambitious remake to see what they do. So I've got that going on and then obviously it releases by the time of this recording tonight. So I'm super hyped to get that popping. Yes, sir. And then um, other than that, it's been Tekken, bro. Tekken, Tekken, Tekken. I can't escape it, bro. I cannot escape it. It is just every day learning what's going on, learning the new characters, adding more people to my repertoire, also the competitive uh, ranking scene, getting my rank mm-hmm. titles up, doing that. Um, there's been huge updates in the tech community right now. They just dropped a, a patch that's going to be going up um, tonight. As the top, time of this recording, it'll be out. The tech in, the infamous Tekken shop is coming. You know oh, what I'm saying? Boy. Which I don't have necessarily a problem with, but I understand the... You don't want pro- the unique low clothes, Cog? <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't want to get I'm, a little unique low on? <laughs> I'm good on that. I'm here for the, I'm the a unique low sweater right now. <laughs> <laughs> Salute. It's all good. Get your get your fashion on. Yeah. All I'm saying is I'm actually here for oh, as a person who played this game for over 30 years, if they want to monetize some of the older Tekken 3, Tekken 4, Jin with the hoodie suits and all that, I don't really have a problem for it. To me, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's monetization, it's cosmetic, right? But I do understand people's upset, like, yo. If they was going to do that, they should have announced it from the beginning because I think that's where the pushback yeah, is. Yeah, the, the post launch move or review right. hit, and then they add monetization. That's the that's right. the old Activision trick, actually. That's, right. That's that's who really invented that mindset. So I get it. I get it. To me, I don't want to say it's a nothing burger. It just doesn't affect me in that way. I don't necessarily think it's extremely nefarious for cosmetics. I'm a person that look. If I want something, I'm going to get it. And you have the option to not get it, but it's cool. I get it. It's a philosophical thing. I totally do you think understand. This game's going to be a problem. You know, do you think you're going to end up throwing a little, a little oh, for sure. something? For sure. <laughs> they're going to have some harangue classic Tekken three suit. I already know what they're going to do. They're going to, I already know this is for me. Mm. I am fully the demographic for this. <laughs> what they call them, the money pig or whatever. Yeah. Like, I am that guy. When it's something I love, I don't care what nobody say. I'm buying it. So I, I can understand people Lucky will say. For me, my guy. favorite character was introduced mm-hmm. in Tekken 7. So, oh, so you're good. Uh, yeah, I don't know if they can add more legacy content to him. Maybe they mm-hmm. add Claudio outfits, but, yeah. you know. For me, I'm not too uh, too concerned so right now. Do good right now. Yeah. So we got that. And then the funny thing right now in the community is there's some patching of what's going on. Right now we're in the balancing patching stuff. So certain character matchups. Some people are upset. I don't know if you see around. A lot of Ling Xiaoyu mains are hot because everybody wants their character nerf. She yeah. goes into the Art of Phoenix stance. She ducks real low. She can avoid certain mids and lows. Mm-hmm. Some of the high professional esports players are putting petitions out. She better get nerf. This is good. And then you got the Ling Xiaoyu. Like, yo, this is a skill character. That's part of her identity. You know, get good, bro. Now yeah. you're getting that energy going I on. Saw, so- I saw a lot of Yoshimitsu <laughs> fans de- depressed because he got nerfed and I, got, oh, I just picked him up and i was having so much fun with him i saw i was like man was, he's the <laughs> first I connected to after claudio i was like oh i finally got it. and i just look at the the patch notes that they they put like down arrows and like oh i see is yoshi like three down arrows in a row I'm like no yeah, man. flash counter the sword counter the sword stuff the damage the healing the aggressive healing you know look i get it makes I, sense. the healing was ridiculous yeah, it, on him it, it, it's a bit much. It's a bit yeah. much. Right now, to me, the two characters who are running roughshod that they have not touched right now is probably Dragon Off is insane right mm-hmm. now. And then um, I would say, what you call got a buff, surprisingly? Um, Azusena. The, yeah, um, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. She got, people were already having trouble with her. She's definitely top tier. I see her used a lot. And she got buffed. Yeah. Or technically buff, but it looked like they were just correcting stuff that wasn't working right. So I'm like, oh, she was just, she was working great with like a busted hip. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. She, she was okay. one, one hip down and she's still killing everybody. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Like we're in the settling pit phase, but one thing I have to praise Tekken, the speed of these updates. And then for yeah, the first time we're getting already. patch, we're getting patch notes with verbiage, Maddie. Yeah, with verbiage. Yeah. I'm like, yo, giving us the understanding of why that is. So we got that. We got online practice mode coming. We got Eddie Gordo with um season one as far as DLC content coming. When's that um, hitting? It, Do you know, or is it? They just said spring because they said they. I, I watched the stream with Harada and Michael Murray, and they kind of want to give themselves a little bit of wiggle room, and they don't want to narrow the date just yet. Okay. But they've done a lot of stuff with Fight Lounge, which I thought is good, and the player match. But overall, man. I'm so happy with this game. The consistent updates, the consistent care has been really great. So that's that. And then surprisingly, last one has been Old Faithful. Yeah, I miss my Bungie. I miss my Destiny. And then they actually, speaking of patch notes and everything that's going on, Newsflash, their dedicated PvP team, which they hired, which they didn't have, we found out, that they hired recently, is actually making new maps, mm. listening to requested features for the longest. I don't want to get too gassed, but they have probably about a, a two-page patch notes about all the philosophical changes of what's happening in the PvP, Trials of Osiris, as well as competitive. Yeah, you've been, is my you've been thing. big on that, so that's good to hear. Oh, yes, and rewards, bro. Like mm. My thing is, in a looter shooter, the problem with Destiny is that it 
it's a, way, a rare game that has PvP and PvE. The problem is the PvP community has all the end game rewards, all the dope stuff. But if you commit to a PvP, you do not, it's not even closely equating to the reward level. So now they're adding artifice armor, which is high end stat armor to competitive PvP. They're doing things with the ranking, they're doing things with the um the lobby matchmaking, the placement. They they on the right way. I ain't gonna front. They're on the right way. The everything that I see from PvP has been at least a year to the last thing they would probably have to do that I don't think they're gonna do, but it's probably dedicated service. And probably at this point they're gonna do it with Destiny mm-hmm. 2. That's probably like a new game at some point. But no, I'm not gonna front. March um fifth, I believe. Or when these uh, patches go up, extremely exciting. So right now, everybody, what you tend to do, this is Destiny culture. When they tell you all the stuff that's going to get buffed and nerfed, what you do is you start farming now and you look at the roles you have now. Oh, that's going to be hot. They go like you, you start scheming it and you, oh, you go, you know what? Let me go farm this dungeon because this is going to be good when these balance updates happen for mm-hmm. certain weapons and stuff and exotic. Okay. So it's a it's a pre-planning thing. If you're I'm, one, one thing about me is I'm a Destiny sandbox guy i love when the sandbox changes perk property changes weapon property changes so they're doing a ton of that including pvp so it's pretty exciting for me so i'm starting to get back and i rated i did i rated with the homies um nice. did the crota raid the revamp. i hadn't done that in a while they did the revamp from destiny one and yeah it was it was really fun it was really good i had a great experience with that nice. so yeah it's been a lot of game playing for me what, what about for you same here uh first one i'll get into star wars dark forces remaster uh i don't think we have the space right now in retro rebound to do a review for it so we're probably not so i'll just talk about it extensively here but um this is a uh, the latest effort from night dive where they just done a really good job like last they did was quake 2 for those who had checked that out and uh this is a game i didn't really know anything about until the remastered was announced and I saw, oh, this is like OG Doom, but Star Wars, which had me really excited because OG Doom, I don't talk about a lot, but I adore that. Like I've played a ton of the OG Doom. I've replayed it over and over. I just the music, the gunplay, the pickups, like it's just satisfying classic FPS gunplay, right? It's it's so good. And so when I saw a Star Wars version of that, I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, like I'm going to be all over this thing. So I've played it and uh, it's pretty good, like visually cleaned up a ton. Some of the tracks I feel could have been scrubbed uh, a little bit better. And I say that because there's like, especially the main menu theme, there's like this drum that they're hitting and it's just sharp. It's just it's sharp to the ear and it doesn't sound very good. People who watch my Persona 3 Reload review know I got an ear for the type of annoying sounds that stand out. Because everyone talks about the frog sound in Persona 3 Reload's soundtrack with the new mass destruction. And I, I called that shit out in my video. I was like, look, I said, that is a problem. I said, it stands out way too much. And I was wondering if I was just being a little weird. But seeing all the comments, Dustin showed me a video. They were full of people making fun of it. I was like, all right, cool, cool. Like, I'm, not, I'm not off. I'm not crazy about this one. Mm-hmm. So I just want to warn people that there are some tracks that just they, they're hitting the drum a bit too hard. <laughs> so- <laughs> Somebody got a little too excited. Yeah, like there's a nice little Star Warsy type of here. Bah, bah, bah. It's it's a little overkill, but okay. not the end of the world. Uh, they actually have some fire tracks in this game. The fourth mission, uh, for those who don't know, the Imperial Research Facility, just moody, atmospheric. But yeah, this is literally a Doom Star Wars, and so the frame rate is great and improved visually. It looks great. Um, the biggest problem I have with the game is I don't think they did enough quality of life in the terms of navigation and mission direction. Um, and so what you have here is a game where uh, the third level I- involves uh, a sewer system. And you have to, you, you get to the middle of the level and there's this switch with like four notches. That, and, and when you hit a notch, it opens up one of four sewer grates. Now, because this is a very old game, every hallway looks the same and they likely just have a different color attached to them which is fine for back then. I know this is a remaster, so they're not going to completely go in and remake it, but I think there were moments that it really demands a remake kind of treatment in some areas, specifically environmentally, because missions like that take way longer because you have to go through the sewers, find particular switches and flip them, and eventually you realize, oh, there's like this one section that as the water gradually raises from you hitting multiple switches and it goes up and up and up, 
then you can surf across the, the, the sewer water into this one particular area and reach your objective and the mission will end. Um, mm-hmm. Another quality of life. And I, I just wish that they had like a waypoint system. The map is I there, did. but it's not super helpful. Something to help guide you around, because if you can't change the environmental assets, that makes sense. But you need to add something to, I think, help direct the player just a little bit. Yeah. These missions are short still, but sometimes they feel long just because you have no fucking clue what you're doing. They can get very confusing. I'm not saying give me a a beat for beat mission log, just some sort of directive if I want to turn it on would have gone a super, super long way here. Um, Otherwise, what happens is you'll finally get to the end of a mission. You'll find your objective, whether it's like a weapon, piece of equipment, uh, a person, and then you got to go all the way back. So the Imperial Research Facility, you spend a while getting into it. You have to like find this specific password, which I figured out. You get in, you move this big tower a number of ways to flip switches down the stair set you go across pick up the piece of equipment they're like okay i got it i'm out and you got to go all the way back and it's just this very confusing layout that there's only one way back to where your ship docked and so missions just don't end when you get the objective you have to find your way back and so that was where i noticed just the navigation in this game is just not good it's just it feels super old and i feel there had to have been something they could have done here i respect preserving the original but even just a click of like the right thumbstick and it just flips on a little arrow that just tells me like, Hey, go that way. That's all I need. Um, so that would have been really nice to have, but yeah, it shoots well. It, it plays well. It is uh, a good, good looking game for what it is. I enjoyed it. Um, it definitely is a little archaic though. And so that's a touch disappointing. Uh, I've been playing final fantasy seven rebirth. Ooh, uh, yeah. I am on oh, yeah. chapter 10 now. Mm-hmm. And uh, this game is so good. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited for everyone to play this game. It's really, to me, just coming down to the ending. You know, it's just about how are they going to nail this nail ending? It? How do they nail it? Yeah. If they nail it. There's people who are expressing concerns. I have not, I have, at this moment in time, not a single concern about the story. Truly. Okay. okay. Actually, if I could note one, it's a mobile character who's appeared twice now and he seems pretty important. And I'm like, okay, this is a Nomura moment. Like, we're taking an Ever Crisis character and bringing him over. And I'm like, yeah. I get this whole, if you played Intermission, you've played Remake, you, you know, yeah. they're doing this very broad Final Fantasy VII universe style approach. Um, and so there, there could be confusion. We'll see. But yeah, Rebirth is excellent. Um, I just got to an insanely emotional part. The, the performances of these characters are so good. They do so much justice to moments that were breezed over in the mm. original, almost like a snapshot view. They've really just expanded them. Um, I don't want to say what, but just it hits so much harder now. I got a question because my main concern, you know, as recording, is going to go up live tonight. And I'm going to be in my pocket. You know what yes, I'm saying? Sir. I get final. So my question is, with the open world change for you, um, if you could comment, I don't want to get you in trouble. Oh, no, 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 no I can. Yeah. We're good. Yeah, we, we're you're good. Out. You're good. We are yeah. way so, past. Yeah, yeah. we're way past. I keep forgetting. I keep forgetting. Yeah, so, like, my concern is, uh, is a lot of stuff, I was, I was obviously going to have a ton of content, ton of side missions, all that stuff, but, like, is it one of those games where you can beeline or, hey, don't make sense because there's so much you miss out that's just high quality if you attempt to beeline? Uh, you can yeah you can but i just number one the design of the game almost makes you feel like i should just be doing this anyway for example like Mm. let's there's two types of content right there's the open world kind of shenanigans you can do you know hit this tower kill this enemy whatever and then there's the actual side quest where maybe you got to go a little bit more out of your way the open world objectives you're probably going to hit anyway because usually the way the game is designed is as you're going to like the next region all of that is between you and that objective marker. So you're going to just Got by it. nature, Got the it. game is so fun to play. You're just going to do it. You're just going gotcha. to. Okay. Uh, okay. And it doesn't add much to your clock. It's got a great pace to it. Uh, the, okay. the biggest annoyance pacing wise is if you mm-hmm. decide to commit, like I'm going to do all the queen's blood matches, I'm going to do all the side quests, all the open world content. Damn. And then you're, you're like, okay, I'm ready for some story. And the game hits you with like one of those. If you've played seven remakes, you know, like uh, I forgot exactly the name of the area was, but, chapter four where you're just running through this very long dungeon in the rafters and, and oh and yeah, yeah, yeah yeah and like you're hitting switches and elevators yes, and it's yes, just yes. and you're like why am i even fucking here and like you eventually get this connection like after two hours of just raw dungeon crawling you're like oh that's why uh they have moments like that scarcely based on my experience thus far but they have them enough where 
you could have that moment of spending so much time with the open world and when you're ready for story, the game just doesn't give it to you. So that's okay. the only kind of pacing concern that I've encountered. But yeah, I think this, I did some side quests yesterday. I, I did one that involved me uh, killing a Tonberry King and the rewards <laughs> you get. Berries. Yeah, and the rewards you get, not like equipment wise, the, the, they pack, the side quests are worth it, not just for the character interactions, but they're so rewarding. Like there's a whole on mechanic to the game that I just unlocked by doing that, which by the way, this side quest was a pain in the fucking ass. I'm going to be honest, but you really had to go out of your way to do it. Like really out of your way, but I did it and I got a really cool reward that I, that I'm surprised they even saved to something optional. I really am, but um, they did it. And I was like, that's, that's how you make it worth it. I mean, there's other nice. ways to make it worth it, but in an open nice. world game, like I think this, they, they got their finger on the pulse. And what you just said there is why I liked Infinite Wealth, because it made me want to do the side content for reasons like that. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. Okay, cool. Like That's the game all I on its own is just fun to play, so you're going to want to engage with yep. this stuff. You, you, and then they just give you the storytelling rewards. They give you nice. the the gameplay rewards. It's it's a it's a good loop. Dope. And so yeah, seven rebirth. I've just been taking my time through it. Like I've been doing every mm-hmm. area one hundred percent. Not every Queen's Blood game, but like I've been doing the side quests and the and the and the open world stuff because it's just fun to go around this world. I I unlocked like a vehicle, and I, I look at how driving in Final Fantasy fifteen was versus how it is now. I'm like. Wow, like how the Ooh. hell, how did they pull this off, man? They did so much with Rebirth and and the way they retain the spirit of, of I can see in my head like that overworld kind of view of Cloud running around on the PS1 and yeah. what that would look like as I'm going from like uh, the Golden Saucer to Cosmo Canyon. And when you look at how they handled it through like story and traversal and open world segments, just okay. bravo. Okay. They, okay. they have done that. Hit. Very good. Nice. Very Excited. good. Excited. And then <sighs> Tekken 8. Bro, I just uh <laughs> I know we already talked about it, so I'll keep it short. Let's but, go, no, let's go. Man, I can't get Talk away. I can't Oof. get away. Yeah, I've thought about it. I think this might be the best fighter ever. I really, mm. I really, I know that's late and not hard, but like that is I'm talking from just how it plays, the roster, the depth. The training tools, it's the, the arenas. I don't think it's a far stretch to be like, this is fucking perfect, man. Like this, I don't, I can't, I can't pull away. I y'all know I have great self-control. I'd like you to do. say that's one of my best traits. I make good life decisions. <laughs> this game is making me make terrible decisions. I have ignored work before for this game. I have snuck in a quick hour of tech and during my lunch break, I put it in quotes like. Oh, that steel book is fresh, bro. See, that's what I'm talking about. Like that game, it just gets on the brain. I will admit I'm getting better now. I'm healing a little bit. And so I'm able to make better choices. But bro, this game had a stranglehold on me. And I had, you know what I had, bro? I had one of those self talks. It was like four in the morning. I'm sitting here just laughing with a character. And I just look at the clock. I'm like, did time really pass? I was like, I got to stop this. I was like, this is... (laughs) This is ridiculous, bro. Matt. I was like, you can't be doing this, bro. Like, you can game late, but th- this is like three nights in a row, 4 a.m. Is it not enough, bro? Like, you play this game a ton. I'm like, yeah, all right. I got to chill and just, bro. you know, I'm not going to pull it out of my life because I feel like it's avoiding the problem. It's like just enough's enough, Matt. So I had bro. to have a self-talk because of Tekken 8. I was like, this game is that incredible to me. It is so fun to play. So- so, so good. good bro it's yeah. funny you say that because the same thing like when you lab it and then you know what happens with me is when i game too long you know you eventually start to come down right you're like all right i'm tired whatever, whatever. the problem with tekken is i'm like so i've labbed right and it ramps you up yeah so, so now you're like okay you but don't settle let, let me now attempt to put what i've learned whether it in dojo practice or arcane and now i'm gonna go on learn yeah. And then the competitive and the tension, and now I can't sleep. And I'm I'm on the edge. Even when I'm winning, I'm like, all right, you you you, you fought a hard match, you beat somebody, you good. And then it's like you still want to keep more. going. Yeah. <laughs> it's the carrot, yeah. and then the ranking goes up, and then you get this, yeah. and it's just, bro, it's so crazy because I don't know if you saw my Twitter. Um, Namco put out a thing to say, hey, show me one of your best aggressive moments. And I was oh, so I proud. I out. fought. A Ling Zayu pay who right now the community feels is busted. And Ling Zayu is notoriously a bad matchup for Harang, right? Bro, 
Mm. I put not only the beats on this person, like I used the heat system flawlessly. Like it was one of my best match. And I saw this dude was killing people, right? I saw it. Yeah. Right? So I was like, this is going to be a tough one. I was so proud of myself. I, 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 I was on such I, I've been so curious what your hall rang is like. Yeah, I'm check them out. Check them out. Check, check out the style. Check out the flat. Yeah. Then look at my little bar. I got the thing. I call it stylish tech because I yeah. like tech to be flashy and yeah, fresh. Oh, look at this. Oh, here you go. Oh, you're probably going to Zhao Yu. Oh! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bro, I got busy on. Like, it was to the point, and here's the fun part. Usually after you beat someone, they got the immediate, they could immediately rebat you. So I click, all right, he going to want that this back. This is such he a cog like, skin, too, the, the blindfold. With the, <laughs> with the blindfold, like I'm the master. <laughs> yeah. I, I love how you're beating up a Zhao Yu who's dressed as Yuffie. That's hilarious. Yes. <laughs> So yo, I beat him and he didn't want to smoke no more. And this is a guy that was dominating. He's like, no, no rematch. I ain't facing you no more. So I was, I was very impressed with myself. So yeah, man, it, it's it's something about that game. It gets the blood pumping. Yeah. And I, you just can't stop it. It is an adrenaline pumper. It is. Yeah. You perfectly captured the loop that I can't escape. Is I go in the lab and I just dick around with the character. In my head, I'm I've convinced myself. Okay, I'm going to play, you know, I'm going to just test some combos, feel it out and think on it some more. Because I feel like Tekken, like half the game is away from it, just yeah, letting technical. things process. There's like a physiological factor yes. to getting good at Tekken. Like just mm-hmm. sitting in front of the TV doesn't make you good at Tekken. It's crazy. And so I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just going to mess around with Lars, just see what's going on here. And then you figure out a combo and you're like, okay, kind of want to try that online now, see if I can pull it off. You see, you go online, you either lose and you go, I need another to pull it off. <laughs> Or you pull it off and you go back in the lab because you got to add another combo bro. on top. And it's, it's facts. It's horrible, bro. It is horrible. <laughs> Last point. This is what I knew this game was a problem. Is now I'm getting so much critical and technical with my losses. So I go through my losses and I'm like, yo, you know, like you fight a character like, yo, I can't do anything with that one particular move. Mm. He's beating me to the punch with this. You know, someone has like a certain move that's just annoying yeah. the hell out of you. Yeah. So you go to the instant replay, right? You get to that part of the match and then you press the left stick in to take control of your character in the middle of the replay. Mm. And I'm like, okay, when he do that, let me see. I don't just try different. When I find something, I'm like, Gotcha. When yeah. you, if I see that move again, <laughs> yeah. I know what to do this time. Like, like it's that. It's Wait, this, you can take control during the replay? Correct. The GOAT. See, I didn't know that. That's insane. This Go is bad for me. That's going to pull me in. I have so many losses where I'm like, how yep. that happened? How the hell happened? Why am I losing? Why am I getting beat to the punch? You go to the replay. It's while you while the match is replaying. Sometimes Namco Tekken will tell you hence your things you shouldn't do. But on any point of the replay, press the left stick in to resume control of whatever side. You immediately for about fifteen second window, I would say, of when when whatever you're watching, you can then take manual control and try to fight back literally in real time. That is brilliant. Goat. That is brilliant. I didn't know that was a feature. That's it's incredible. That's that's yeah, that's over for me. Cause I was well, what I was doing was watching the replay and then going in the lab and seeing like, okay, like what's the frame date? I was making it way more complex for myself. That's huge. Bro, it's muscle memory. Cause there's I think there's an Elisa right now. She was giving me palms. She got these zoom pass moves. Oh, I didn't know bro, what the hell got, was going on. She got some crazy lows. Yeah, crazy lows. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, okay, now I can see what and I was trying to like, damn, this ain't working. This ain't working. Oh, but that works. Mm. And then I was stopping it. And I was like, okay. And you just learn, bro. And some things I was like, oh, wait, you ain't supposed to interrupt. You got to block. You got to wait until this person finishes this whole combo because you're going to get pounded out. So, yeah, that is what makes it. It's the learning and the dojo of tech. But the replay system in conjunct, people just worry about the goal system. Worry about now the replay system, Maddie. Trust me, you yeah, gonna take bro. your game to the next. And I know you feeling yourself because you changed your avatar to Claudio <laughs> on the score. So I know you getting better because I know now you assuming your personality. That's my <laughs> bitch. I already know y'all Claudio means. I know how y'all do. Y'all know it. He's giving me a problem right now. He's Dude, got some stuff for Harang. It's he it's. I I just love Claudio as a character. Like he's just to me. I'm like he is the coolest fighting character. Like his style of like just like one flip in the hand the way his eye turns black when he gets yeah, starburst oh, I'm, even he's some of his moves like he's got this uh i think it's four two where he just takes a knee and just yeah fires oh, out bro it's it's un it's he's so sick and i'm just like he's yeah sick. i just need to because what i'm trying to do here is i'm trying not to be a one trick but me changing my profile picture was accepting the yeah. one trick that's been just cast upon me it's like all right man 
Harada san, my my fate for Tekken Nine is in your hands. If you do not bring this man back, my career well, is over. Fat. Because I, I, I need te- I you. need my man Claudio because yeah. I just I'm good with other characters. I'm still messing around like Lars. Right now, I'm at the point where what's happened this last week in the Tekken report from Maddie is mm-hmm. Lars. I'm playing. It's like I think I'm not there yet. It's like I like mm. he's got a lot of double inputs, uh, like you know, yeah. press square and triangle to start combos or. One of his is called, I think, Lines Rush, where you have to go like forward, back, square, triangle, real Four, quick. Three, I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm like, man, I'm not, I'm not, not there yet. Him. I'm yep. not there yet. Like, I'm not good enough yet. So I was like, I got to pick someone else out. I find Yoshimitsu. Man gets nerfed. So I'm like, now I'm on the hunt again. I'm looking and I'm like, I think I'm just a Claudio one trick because no one else is. No, it happens. I got to figure happens. it out because I need that backup because what's happened, I play with my friends that all mm. this time is just played with my friends mostly. They know every Claudio trick, so it's like I can only mix it up so much. So much. No, I <laughs> like, got I'm you. trying I got so you. hard to pull out every move in his kit, but like it's not feasible every match to use the hundred plus move list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you fall you, into you know, your patterns, right? Yeah. Part of it's like f- lack of familiarity benefits you. So I, I'm trying. It's helped me elevate it, but like I gotta find a backup just so it's like yes. Claudio is my confidence piece, and yes. if he loses, it's like. Man, I'm not yeah, playing yeah. this game anymore. See, now. what you got to do is you got to get your number two. So what yeah. you do is he protects the boss. He protects Claudio. Yeah, you exactly. don't have to bring Claudio out. You're not worthy for Claudio. You got to go through. That's him what I'm first. trying to you figure gotta, out. Yeah, that's what Lee Chow Lang is. The for worst me, is like, when you lose a bunch of times with your second and yeah. friends are like, oh. bring out Claudio, Matt. I'm like, no, man, I'm not feeling right. <laughs> I don't want to have him lose. It's so protective of my Claudio performance. I feel you, man. You're gonna, you're gonna get it. Do the replays, bro. Trust me, you're gonna be. It's so funny you brought that up because that's gonna just. I'm gonna be on hinge tonight. <laughs> oh, 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 the goat. We had a funny question here that I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and cover just because we have the benefit of very few news and lots of write ins. Blay writes in. Hello, Dukers. First time writing in since you and Cog are enjoying Tekken 8 so much and Cog has a love for fighting games. I got to ask, have you guys ever been in a fight? Any funny stories of them? If so, or even the silliest reasons you've actually thrown hands, seen many close encounters just from video games with friends back in the day. Love the show. You guys are such genuine dudes. Have a, I got smoked, and then you hear Xbox record that. <laughs> Yo, that used to be disrespectful with Xbox One yeah. era. Yeah, the right. Xbox One era, Xbox record that was the best way to fucking just put twist a knife that you just beat someone's. Did that all the time in Killer Instinct. Thanks. Cog, you're such a nice guy. I can't imagine you throwing hands, but I know that Cog temper lies quietly in the background. Has there ever been a time where blows have been traded? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't have a lot of fights, but I can remember two. I remember two. You know what my problem is? I don't usually get the people who I'm enemies with never got to that point where we got there, mm-hmm. but he ended up being my friend. <laughs> 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 it was one of my close friends. Shout out to Oz, man. That's my dude. We was, this is like, this is athlete cog. This is cog trying to go to NBA. Oh, Cog is like, you know, one of the hot little point guards in the South Bronx playing high school ball. And um, I went to also Manhattan to High School where Cameron and Makes went to to school, but they were a year ahead of me. So um, this was during that day when, you know, your boy had spring. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A little dribble. And I was a great defender. So anyway, long story short is this is my best friends in. You know, he, me and him was so competitive. I remember like we would go, we would practice together. We work out, we go to, we would go to different basketball courts and hoop and like play the best competition. So what happened is I remember there's that period of development where you spring ahead of somebody mm. and mine was like, don't get it touching the rim for the first time. Mm. And he was like, yo, I knew you ain't just touched the rim, yo. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I was like, yeah, you know, kind of thing. So we just had this competitive. He was a great player too. He ended up. Surpass, wait, surpass at me mm. but at that time i was the guy right yeah. so yeah things got a little heated you know and you know of course there's people around you showing off your friends you you kind of showing up the homie and we got a little we got tense we got tense shove turned into another shove and yo then you fouled me bro and no you didn't and so yeah, about basketball that's the closest i ever got so yeah, funny. basketball, man. And we end up slugging in front of it was literally on my block. They had to break <laughs> us up, man. I was just like, oh, I can't believe it. it was surreal. I'm like, yo, I'm really about to fight one of my best friends. This is crazy. <laughs> our egos was too much. Like my ego was too much. You couldn't tell me. He couldn't tell you couldn't tell him. Mm. So we had to cool down. It, it messed up the friendship for about a couple months, but as men, we got back together. Yeah, like, no, that's that's what's important. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably closer like, than ever now. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, absolutely. That's what I'm saying. Like, right now, you call me right now, and everything's good. But um, and then the second one was just stupid. I actually told the story of Constellation. Um, this it was it was it was this is again now this is Cog going from messing with the 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 nerds and the people who I was like my gamer friends and stuff like mm-hmm. that, and then be also being around the the hardcore, the hard rocks, and the cool kids, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I was in that pocket where I could go either way. So I forgot what happened. I don't know what put me in this situation where they wanted me to kind of go at one of my guys and. It, it just tempers fled, and I, I don't know why I allowed myself. That's why I learned myself never be peer pressured or manipulated by someone else. And yeah. this was literally that I got caught out there. And he said, oh, yeah, he's a cornball. Da, 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 da. And then he must have heard it. And he was like, oh, you hang with these dudes now? And yeah, yeah then that popped off into something. This was in school. Wow. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that, and it sucked because that kid I was super tight with. And one thing you learn about me is anybody who makes me laugh, I end up being really close with. That's why me and King are like, you know, he's family, but me and King are like this. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, this is kid. Take, shout out to Tyshawn Rouse. <laughs> if you're listening, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was me. No, I was wrong. I was wrong. I should have never let some outside dudes come between our friendship. Mm. And I learned it. I learned that. We didn't talk for a long time. Yeah. We didn't talk for a long time. That messed up. That was one of my yeah. closest friends in in um junior high school. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, yeah, those are probably the two times and stupid, silly reasons. But other than that, I'm the dude that don't really get into fights. Like, I know yeah. it sounds like I do, but I really don't. Like, I'm mostly the guy that's diffusing situations. So, yeah. what about Maddie? Uh, <laughs> Everybody Can you imagine right that? <laughs> All right. The answer is no. <laughs> but I could see if someone, like, I can see a situation where someone's kind of like messing with you or kneeling with you. Maybe after a while, maybe you had enough for something. Maybe you know me well, yeah, for sure. I okay. I've not actually been in a fight before. Uh, oh, well, but- like if you count training for martial arts, even then it was sparring with equipment on. Yeah, um, I wouldn't call that a fight. I've made mm. physical contact, uh, I guess, but you know, not necessarily like a, a throwing hands situation because. I want to go my whole life without having to fist fight someone. Like I really don't find anything productive out of it. And that's always been my demeanor. There were plenty of times in high school. I, I think my demeanor has always just pissed people off. Like if the internet told me anything, it's just that like sometimes like my resting bitch face or, or just my, my like tone when I'm not trying to be an asshole, like just bothers people. And I remember there were times in high school, like I'd get a text from a dude and he's like calling me out. He's like, meet me at the field. I, like I'm gonna kick your ass. And I was like, I'm not fucking going. Like I, I'm like I weigh like 90 pounds, bro. Yeah, up to the beat. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You're gonna fucking hit. You're gonna have your way with me. Like I'm f- not gonna fucking show up, bro. What, what pride do I have? Like you're gonna kick my ass. No, I'm good. And so like it would never come to blows, and we'd eventually talk it out because I'd always they'd confront me and they'd be like, "Why'd you show up?" I'm like, "I don't know you. I don't want to fucking fight you." Like, and they're like, "Yeah." Like, it just that's how it always ended up. I I got lucky because there was definitely times I had a a friend where like I remember someone wanted to kick my ass again. I don't know mm-hmm. why. This this was like my high school experience in freshman year. Like it it was as mortifying as I had feared. I didn't do anything, and this guy was about to like. I think the term would be like snuff. Like he would hit me from behind. Oh, snuff you! Oh yeah. no, not the snuff. Yeah, with the not looking. and I guess my friends. I, I found out the next period. She, she was like, I stopped him before he did that. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, what? I, I had no idea. Oh. I probably went unconscious on the floor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, worse. I got lucky for sure. But uh, I had those near misses, and I. I mm. I guess my demeanor, while it may have agitated people, just was as equally able to cool things off or I was saved in one instance when I probably would have got my ass kicked. Um, but I was never like a brat to anyone. I kept to myself because I was kind of like a loser. I was a gamer. So I just knew my place. I was like, I'm not going to try to punch above my weight and, and do much here. So yeah, I never really been in a fist fight before. The closest I got, this is probably a funny mental image for the audience. So we were, it was Rangers playoff hockey. Gets the Flyers, the Philadelphia oh, Flyers. So you already know this is beef. two fan bases that despise okay. each other. I never kind of co-signed this whole clearly based on my demeanor on games, tribalistic mentality for anything. Like I love the Rangers, but I'm not going to go get a fist fight on the behalf yeah. of their team. Nah. It just I, I don't hate you because you're a Flyers fan. Like I think the Flyers are whack, but I'm not like yo, let's go, bro. You fuck a weirdo. You like the Flyers? <laughs> like I'm just not like that. So I do remember the closest I got though was. Let's go. Um, we were walking out of mm. the, the Rangers one. It was game one of the, the the year that they almost that they almost won the cup in 2014. Mm. And okay. I was we were walking out, and this dude 
was just being fucking belligerent. Like he Not was, it was like really agitating me because he threw. I remember it was a fly, two Flyers fans walking out. It was a guy and I think his girlfriend, and they were, mm-hmm. they were walking out. And this Rangers fan was just being an absolute cockhead, bro. Like this guy threw his beer at the chick. Fan? Yeah, the Please. Rangers fan was harassing the Flyer fan. Oh, the Rangers fan was harassing yeah. the Flyers fan. Yeah, because okay, we were in home territory, so they right. So you home, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exited yeah. The, the, the venue now. Yeah, so okay. we're exiting, we're leaving, and mm-hmm. this guy throws a beer can at, and it's pretty full at the woman, and the dude gets from the Flyers fan gets in the the Rangers fan's face, and the Flyers fan I think made the right call, just like this dude's half cocked, probably drunk. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. don't fuck with them. So we continue walking out. This dude just disappears and circles mm-hmm. around. And again, this dude's belligerent. And as we're walking out, by the way, I'm in a Rangers jersey. So I don't know right. how this happens, but he gets in my face as I'm walking towards the exit. And my brother was behind me. And I remember heading to that game. I told my brother I was a little nervous going in because I said, it's a Flyers playoff game. Like that, mm. that shit's intense. Like I, said, I don't yeah. need to like, I, I was yeah. definitely being a bit of a bitch, but like, I was like, I don't, I was kind of nervous this would happen. Yeah, because you know, listen, it, it reminds me of Red Sox Yankees back in the prime days. Yeah. When people that used to happen in the Bronx all the time. Yeah, exactly. That kind mm-hmm. of energy. And mm-hmm. I just I was a little nervous about it, but I was like, all right, yeah, I gotta grow up. Like this is ridiculous. Like I just gotta go live my life. Like that's not mm-hmm. and so I got over it. But I didn't realize how quickly that fear turned into reality. This dude got mm-hmm. in my face. And so I shoved him off because he was like this close to me. And I was like, yes. like, nah, I was like, bro, I don't even fucking know you. And when I shoved him off, he was coming back to me, but his friend grabbed him because he knew I was, I was ready at that point. I was like, once yeah. I shoved him off, I was like, I know. Yeah, this, you know where this yeah I was like, yeah, this is going point. somewhere, but I had yeah. no drinks in me. I was like, I knew my brother yeah. was with me, so I felt a little more confident. Yeah, like, if I was I solo, probably would have just walked probably off. Not. Yeah, if I was I solo, that. Yeah, I, I, that. I 100% would have walked off. But no one, my brother yeah. was there. I was like, I'm going to throw a shove here because I I, exactly. feel a little, I know I'm not going to get ganged off. up on. So his friend said, you know, Fred saved him from a little ass kicking from Maddie at the at the base floor of MSG. That's the closest yeah. I ever got, though. I um, it. I and definitely, it. that was before any martial arts training. So that, that probably, mm-hmm. I don't know how that would have went for me. I didn't work that much at that point. So mm-hmm. Definitely my bravado oh. talking there. But that's the thing oh. is I don't let my emotions take over. Like, that was a mistake. That was a mistake. And I'm never like, I'm not, that's, I just don't think it gets anywhere. You know, some people need that to like, but I just feel like if you need a fist fight to like figure out your emotions, then you just don't know how to handle your emotions. I've Facts. always been pretty, I feel good at handling my emotions and understanding them and talking to others about theirs. So I think that's why I've never been in a fist fight because if there's an opportunity, unlike a fly or a Rangers fan who's in my face and drunk, there's typically a moment to talk it out and come to an understanding and maybe make a friend out of it. Exactly. So. Yeah. Uh, you spot, man. It, it, it ain't worth it all at the end of the day. Never worth it. But nonetheless, Ladies and gentlemen, Tekken 8, great fighting game. <laughs> All Ooh, right, we got down. a bunch of write-ins here because, like I said, the news is dry. Like I'm looking at our news section. We have one, and it's about the layoffs happening around the industry. So we got four write-ins here. Let's go through some of them here. What we're really talking about is the the fallout of the Xbox decisions that have been made here. You know, what the, the, the infamous four, what games are coming after we have, you know, what other games could come over that are live service. We have many questions here. So we're just going through them all. That's kind of like our main, if you will, news of the week. So one tick hole has the first write in. Good day, Dukes. Now that we have the infamous four first party games officially announced and what platforms they are leaving to, we inevitably have shifted the conversation to what's next. Many titles have been floated out there as to what they may be next to leave the platform. And I'm unfortunately here to be the bearer of bad news that Hellblade two is next on the chopping block. This is a game that has been in development for a long time, using very costly tech to deliver mind-blowing levels of fidelity. Yet somehow this game does not pass the smell test when it comes to the question of financial success. As much as the first Hellblade was adored by hardcore gamers, it barely managed to surpass 1 million units sold a year after launching on a, as a PlayStation timed exclusive, also launched PC day one. When I picture that kind of sales performance from a project Xbox has invested what is clearly a fuck ton of money into, I see executives slamming the panic button. I personally don't see this game staying Xbox or exclusive to the Xbox console past the holiday season, but I could very well be wrong. That's just my read on the situation. What say you, Duke? So we'll talk about other options here, but Cog, when you look at Hellblade 2, by the way, I'm glad one tick hole brought this up. Mm-hmm. PlayStation exclusive history. Yeah. Do you see this being one that makes the leap? Because it's also been one that they've mentioned when they've clarified there are exclusives on the way. Hellblade 2 has been one that's usually the first to be brought up, probably because it's the closest by. But what do you make of this uh, analysis here 
is one to call on to something. I mean, I understand where he's going with it. I mean, look, first, let's just say for the record, say nothing's off the table. We, I think we all believe that, you know, the Jest 4 is not going to remain at Jest 4, especially if we if they see any type of success. And I forgot to mention last time that, I don't know if I do, did mention last time that, you know, some of the games that did come over also are going to the PlayStation 4 base, mm-hmm. which I thought was mm-hmm. very interesting, right? You did because that. that yeah. yeah, that to me shows that there are still a lot of PlayStation 4 owners who didn't switch over and that base is still lost. But to this question with Hellblade, Look, look, is it a single player game? Yes. Is it a game that you can't really monetize? Yes. And yeah, to his point, it did have PlayStation sensibilities, right? So it'll be interesting. I think right now, this is what I'm looking at. I think at what they, they I think what they realize is that there are certain franchises that are either core and integral to the experience, like for example, the the Halo, the Gears, the Force, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the Big Mac shake and large fries, right? Mm-hmm. That they understand that if you pull that, there's consequences with the base. I think I am of the belief that everything is up for grabs on some level, but because of the negative response from the community, especially with Starfield, right? And with, with Indiana Jones, right? Because people feel that these are big titles that they waited for. They wanted to see the fruits of Xbox's labor, you better not put those over, right? Hellblade to me falls into that category. Sure. But one tick has a good point. If you look at it from a pure business standpoint, this is not a game you can really monetize. And we did feel it was interesting at the $50 price point, right? They, they yeah. said it was not going to be $7. They said it was going to be a shorter game. Look, I'm in the mindset I'm not fooling myself. Anything is possible. As of right now, I'm going to say no, but with an asterisk, right? We got to see how this thing performs. We got to see how it goes. I will say this. If it is a, if Hellblade 2 is like a 90 Metacritic and it's like gets a zeitgeist ball, gets that, what Maddie calls it, they they become the the naughty dog energy (laughs) from, you know, Ninja Theory. That changes the conversation, I feel sometimes. I feel that, this is how I look at it. That's my final point. I look at something like Hi-Fi Rush, which is an extremely high quality game, exclusive, single player, can't really monetize it, right? But I think the reason why that's going is because I'm brutally honest, the ecosystem did not buy the game the way they anticipated. They, mm-hmm. and I, I, had, I spoke to Grubb, I had him on, he, he had told me, he was like, they had some internal talk, not that it was a flop, but it didn't reach those internal targets. Mm that's going to be a, the key for me with a situation like Hellblade. Does it reach those t- targets? And I think it comes down to how well the game reviews. But the cool thing about Hellblade in, con- in, con- in difference with uh, Hi-Fi Rush is I did feel the stealth drop potentially hurt it. I do feel that in my heart. Yeah. And I feel that this would a proper marketing be, and this was essentially launched with the console as a proof of concept of how great the Series X could be. So I, in my opinion, they know that if th- this is something that can't come over anytime soon, <laughs> provided it doesn't flop. That's my final answer. Yeah, I think the announcement with the Series X is probably the biggest thing that would work against them here. I think there's a lot business-wise and optics-wise that can support Hellblade 2 making the jump being one of those games. But I think with that announcement next to the series console, like that was sort of a... It, that's the one thing I will say I was totally wrong about, and I, I I don't blame myself for it, but it felt like a statement game. It really did. With the way they were showing off that game and announcing it with the Series X, that felt like a statement game. And I don't know if something changed in the development where they scaled things down. To make it $50, to my knowledge, at least from what I've experienced and like when I interviewed uh, Mike Rose of No More Robots, like I asked him about game prices. We also asked uh, Graham about that when yes, we talked yes. about him for uh, for... I am nobody saved the world, which is from Drinkbox. Um, Mm -hmm. We talked about game pricing, and I know Graham had mentioned that they have like a spreadsheet, and he just says he keeps all like the indie games, their price point, and their game length there. And so it's usually that plus the budget you spend. If you spend a lot of money, like the reason we get some of these AAA games that are like, why are you charging this much for this little? And it's usually because they spent that much, and so they need to recoup as quickly as possible. So if they're charging 70, they have to sell fewer copies. And some games you have the benefit of like being a hell divers too. You know, you budgeted it right. Let's charge 40. And they're probably making a stupid amount of cash now because it was a smaller budget game doing explosively well. So um, the price point is an interesting 
topic of debate. But I think when you look at Hellblade, this is one I could see eventually making the jump for sure. I mean, like you mentioned, Cog, I think everything is on the table and eventually will. I do think it's a matter of when, not if. Uh, but with Hellblade 2, this is part of the, you got to think of like a, a fun, fancy nickname for them. The draft class of 2018, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Ninja yeah. Theory was one of the first announced studios as part mm-hmm. of this new initiative for Xbox. And uh, I think when that was also one of the biggest surprising ones, like when you saw Undead Labs, Playground, like there was a lot of, oh, OK, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, that makes but sense. The crowd, yeah. when you go back to that video and you watch that announcement, yeah. the crowd really blew up with Ninja Theory because it was that, what? They just made a PlayStation exclusive. What? Yeah. So yeah. it would be really they have to do, they have to time it right. And I don't know if there's ever going to be a right time, but uh, Hellblade 2, I could see making the leap, especially because, dude, if you're a bean counter and you know even a little bit about PlayStation and what games succeed there, just by camera perspective alone, Hellblade 2 mm. looks like the type of game that would really thrive on a platform known for making those types of games exclusive. Mm. So, yeah, I just, I, I think the more I pondered it, it feels like too good of a fit to ignore and I just, I, I think it gets out of 2024 as an exclusive, mm-hmm. but I'm, the thing will be how quickly it ramps up. And I think mm-hmm. with Xbox playing this wait and see approach, a lot of it's going to be decided based on what others are doing. If they see, you know, PlayStation's ramping things up. And I don't mean like just going to other platforms. I'm talking about like ramping up PC strategy and stuff. If they can point to something and go like, look what they're doing. I mm-hmm. think they're going to ramp things up quicker on their end and start mm-hmm. pushing toward that because it just means uh, more money in their pocket, and we'll see how yeah, Xbox fans respond see. to that. We got to see. Very good questions. We have another great one here. JT has toast. Writes in, "Hey Dukes, you both stated that live service games should be multi-platform to get the most players, and I agree. Then what about Halo Infinite? I understand some Xbox fans would never want Halo to be on PlayStation. However, is Halo Infinite multiplayer the perfect game to go multi-platform? Infinite multiplayer is a free live service game that's looking for its big comeback moment." after its live service failings. I know it has more players than last year, but do you really think Microsoft is pleased with the overall performance after putting so much resources into it? I think infinite multiplayer going to PS5 would give the game a solid increase of players and increase in season pass purchases and give PlayStation users a taste on how good Halo feels to play. And if PlayStation users want more, they can get single player infinite and the MCC on Xbox or PC thoughts. Have a, your main squeeze Xbox is back at home but your side girl PlayStation is outside the club looking fire kind of day. Thank you for writing in JT. Yeah, hey, people yeah. love that short. I'm so glad Ben made it when I requested yeah. it. That short of you and your uh, your little <laughs> analogy there, it was exquisite. It was wonderful and the audience loved it. So I really, this is a mindset that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, when you look at Halo, it's the one that you probably want to protect because of optics, right? But if we're looking at games that I think could make the biggest splash, I think Halo would be that one because that is synonymous with Xbox. And for it to go elsewhere, I feel like there's no doubt it would do pretty well. But I'm curious what your thoughts on this are. Could infinite multiplayer go over, but you keep the single player portion of things and MCC here on the Xbox ecosystem? Because I feel like MCC is also just as great of a candidate. So what do you think of this? I mean, well, technically, Halo Infinite is free to play. (laughs) (laughs) Free to play. Look, from a technical standpoint, from the style of game it is, yeah, it makes sense. The the issue comes down to how aggressive with what I consider the core competencies of Xbox, you know, are they willing to go? And that's the question. We do agree there will be more than four. But what is the criteria? Is it failing franchise? Is it just, hey, live service needs to go? The problem here is that even though it makes perfect, I could see how they do it. Let me just give you the scenario in your favor. Like I could see how they do it where they go, okay, you know what? Get them infinite. It's been past the cycle now. And oh, by the way, Xbox fans, here's the new Halo game, mm. right? So it's like you don't feel like you're getting cheap. I could see how they pull that off. Yeah. The question for me when it comes to the Halos, the Gears, the Forza is – Are they at that point where they are willing to deal with what I consider brand damage? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, these are core franchises to the Xbox experience. Not saying that it can't ever happen, but these are the internal questions. Is it worth it 
And I don't know that answer with core competencies because this is, again, we're in uncharted territory, man. man. We're in uncharted territory. We've never seen a major console holder say, hey, we're going third party on certain games. We're going to spread the wealth, but also we're making hardware, right? So this is, we, we don't know how this works, right? So there's still a part of me that still says it's going to be measured for a while. Certain things that fail. Certain live services may be from the publishers, but when it comes down to, but then again, I gotta, I gotta contradict myself because Sea of Thieves did go. Sea of Thieves is a new IP. Sea of Thieves is Xbox Game Studios, right? Core competency. No, that's a good point. It's just going to come down to the, what I consider how, how much they're willing to keep brand identity and i don't yeah. know that answer right now and i think we'll know you know what i'll know mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what i'll know because right now they're giving me conflicted messages they're telling me oh it's not part of the four mm. so you are aware that that the, there was pushback that people did not want starfield to go yeah right yeah but you didn't really answer the question you just said it's not part of the four right now. That doesn't mean it's never coming. You see what I'm saying? So that's the thing, right? So it's still up in the air. I don't know. I will still say it's fluid. I'm, for now, it's still fluid until they see the data back on the ones, the four that they sent. Mm-hmm. But let's just say they, they start to pop off. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> that could change things. That could so it's fluid. It's fluid. No, it's it's funny you bring up Starfield because I just did as we record this today. I just did a little mm-hmm. mini retrospective, if you will, just talking about the game five months later, the reception, the zeitgeist, the player count. The player count, I will say, with Starfield is in a spot where I was definitely one of the people kind of hand waving, going like, mm, "Let's not react right now." But looking at it five months later. I did some analysis. I looked at Fallout 4. I looked at the DLC release patterns for Fallout 4, Skyrim, obviously Starfield not having any, and their update patterns. And Starfield is in a really weird spot right now where like these updates need to be more significant. They are not doing enough and they need to add features and content and they need to do it fast. And the creation kit needs to be out ASAP. Like they need to start injecting life in this game where I wonder if what they're going to, one of the game plans they could start to deploy at Xbox is once things are done, then it goes over, right? Because now you've extracted all the value from the core base, and now it's just extra money from the rest. What, what, what about a shattered space? What about you? Talk about like a post shattered space? Expansion? Yeah, post post shattered space. I don't know when they'll do Starfield because I feel like that's the one. I would argue you have to protect that above Starfield, right? I would Ooh. because I feel like that is in the terms of modern importance like you damaged halo i love halo but you damaged halo with infinite's mm-hmm. release and its state and five and its release and its state and the mishandling of things that like you just you did do damage even if you're a staunch halo defender i respect that i think infinite's had a great bounce back so has mcc Absolutely. but there's no denying damage has been dealt where if you're talking value nowadays starfield you got to protect that above all else if you're xbox but at the same time once you've gotten all the you know, if you're reaching but beyond the wall garden and that player count is starting to dwindle off and you're committing to multiple years of support, I think Starfield is, I treat it as a live product, so I don't think it'll be done for years. So I think, in, I'll just say this, in the middle of its lifespan, I think it would go to PS5. I just, yeah. I just think so. And, and what that creates is an awkward scenario that I think Jez Corden brought, brought up of, look, if you look at Starfield now and when you look at it years from now, I'm a believer that Star, like time will be kind to Starfield and there's a possibility that. that the competitive competing platforms are going to get the best, get the best form version of... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> they they get the home with 60 frames? Yeah, they're going to get the home with 60 frames, the home, oh, with man. the home with vehicles, the home with more things to do in between uh, these these procedurally generated uh, pieces of content. Is that a going to be higher? Is yeah. it going to be good now? No, I'm just no, it's gonna be higher. Yeah, you're going to be able to go to every moon. There's going to be seamless space travel. Space travel is all going to be there. Uh, so that's the thing I worry about is I think the betrayal of Xbox fans, like a lot of them quickly got up here. And then Phil and team just kind of gave these marketing spins and then they just immediately tried to go back down here. Like, it's all good. Everything's the same. And I'm like, no, things are changing, y'all. And like, you're going to be back up here when you start to see just all the shit that they're going to do in the coming years. And uh, even things that I think you're nice and comfortable with are going to go. One that Mm -hmm. I know this is a question about Halo. And I do Mm -hmm. think the idea here of infinite multiplayer, like, I think that's a tool you got to utilize, whether it be, hey, let's just, which it doesn't seem like they're going to do, but. 
I wish that they continue to build out Infinite's multiplayer and use that as a platform. And as you made new mainline Halo games, just injected Infinite with life. Because I think the game plays wonderfully. The content's there. Forge is there. Like you got it up and running. Now you just need another modern Halo thing to happen to kind of shoot people back into where the multiplayer is. But if we're talking about things that Xbox has had for a while that I think would make the jump first, I think it's Forza. I think when you look at either that or one of your IPS is like Halo. I think one of those two, if you're looking for a big splash, if like these four don't pan out well and you're looking for a, a big splash, you either take Forza, which has competed against Gran Turismo and mm-hmm. has out, outdone it, or you address the lingering thing that PlayStation does not have anymore, and that's first-person shooters. Uh, mm-hmm. They used to have them and really good ones at that. And so now you have the chance to be like the supplier of the FPS to the PlayStation ecosystem, and you can make a lot of money on that. It goes back to what we said, though, right? Short-term versus long-term. What do you do long-term damage-wise to the brand with these types of right. moves versus the short-term gains? I'm rambling now, but any thoughts on any of the ideas that's been yeah. out there? Look, look, from a financial standpoint, it makes sense. I, I still think there's a part of me that feels that the reaction to Phil coming on that stage and saying it's not by the way it's not indiana jones it's not stuff to me that shows their sensibilities to core franchises still yeah. so i still think we even though they are transitioning we are still in the earlier stages oh of yeah. It. yeah so i think that we still a ways out and i think a lot of it is fluid based on the success of what comes over initially so mm. It's hard to make for me to make a definitive statement because I don't know how this is going to plan out Mm -hmm. and I don't know how successful these titles are. But if I had to guess, they are going to do everything in their power to hold off on those major ones unless, you know, things start to trend otherwise. So it's a good question. I, I don't think anyone suggested these things is out of pocket. Yeah. I don't think anyone said, yo, bro, you bugging for even thinking about that. No, no, they're thinking about that. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're definitely, you know what I'm saying? So it, it's just going to see, it's going to be critical to see how the strategy works. And as well as, I think another key data point, like I said, at nauseum, how does ABK affect Game Pass? That's another thing. And again, it could be a situation where then they start clicking on all cylinders and they only want to send over failed or non-performing things. That's another thing to look at. I know this is just getting away from the initial question more, but I just want to know Mm -hmm. what you think of what I would call Xbox's sequel bait in like, oh, we're going to bring these games elsewhere and if they get more of an audience, we're going to do more with this. Number one, do you think the belief there is that, okay, Hi-Fi Rush sold really well on PS5. We're going to make Hi-Fi Rush 2. I don't believe Xbox is foolish enough to have convinced themselves that Hi-Fi Rush 2 is going to be a system seller. So it is like, it, it, like are they just going to make a sequel multi-plat this time? And same thing with Pentiment. It's like, okay, you're going to investigate what a Pentiment 2 looks like, which is awesome. Like That is a really big optical win because fans love it. It may not be your biggest game, but like if you can do another one of those, that, that pleases a particular part of your audience. Like the same kind of audience that I think PlayStation neglected with a lot of its censorship with visual novels that then people just let ship over to Switch. So I think there's a, a value to that sort of stuff, the niche audience is being addressed. But I look at the sequel bait stuff where I think a lot of Xbox fans have convinced themselves, oh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna get Pentiment 2 here. You get Pentiment 1 over there, but like we're gonna get it here. Do you foresee things actually playing out that way and and do you think it's actually going to make a difference in them making a hi-fi rush too like could hi-fi rush on ps5 really sell enough to make them go oh yeah oh yeah we need to do a sequel on this like that's what i wonder Mm -hmm. like will it have because you got away from the big pop you're releasing it in a busy time uh it was shadow dropped initially that the only time you've announced it with the lead up you gave it like three weeks which Mm -hmm. is a great shotgun blast for like how things are going now but i just wonder Would it be enough anyway? But go ahead. Yeah, Take it away. no, it's a great question because that was literally the IOP poll question that I posed to our community. I said, mm. if this, I literally said, if Xbox new strategy of launching former exclusive games to PlayStation and Switch proves to be successful, which of these approaches regarding sequels do you want them to adopt? Look at that. One was keep sequels exclusive for at least one year. Um, Sequels, just uh, day and date, multiply, just off the bat. Um, only live service games, multiplat only. And then I just had a silly one. I always make a silly last one, you know. I love like, game Pass, I have Game Pass, I win. No, no, <laughs> whatever silliness I had. So look, I'm going to tell you what I think they're thinking. 
I think that they think that they will bring attraction to their service if they keep the sequels exclusive to Xbox. Because in their mind, they go, now PlayStation knows what Hi-Fi Rush is. Oh, now Switch 2, you know what it is. Here's the new new mm. over here. Their thinking, I'm not saying it's correct, but their thinking is, oh, you you going to want to taste. You're going to want to taste. You know what Chai 808 feel like. You like that, didn't you? Nah. Here we go. Here's the new new. And <laughs> you're going to wait. You don't know when it's going to come. You go. You could get it, yes, but you don't know. You're going to wait for the year. So that's the thing. Now, I will, the only chink in my armor with this theory is that I do feel live service games will. So I think Sea of Thieves 2 has a stronger chance of saying we're everywhere when we're ready. That's a name I never thought I'd hear. Sea of Thieves 2. I know. You think they do that? (laughs) Probably not. But I'm just making it because it's the only thing I can kind of compare right now that went over. But um, I I think live service or a new, like, for example, we we talked about Bethesda potentially making a a new Doom or something, right, or whatever. There's a chance, right? There's certain things that I feel live service it just makes sense. If they make a fighting, I don't feel like a fighting game. Like if you want to do Killer Instinct or something like, like, I don't think that makes sense to lock that down if you want. Look at what, te- we, look how we're raving about Tekken. Tekken mm-hmm. is multi-plat. It's cross-play, mm-hmm. cross, like it's, so it's all over. Your theory yeah. is kind of like fortify the strengths and address the weaknesses. So if yes. you already have a strength on the platform, keep that exclusive. If it's a weakness though, kind of let it go and hope the sequel yes. lures people in to fortify yep. like that, say a fighting that, game weakness. Like you bring out a new killer instinct and then you make an exclusive something fighting game and, and, and you bring, because you've, you've kind of got new fighting fans in the platform. Um, they'll come there instead. The reality is this, we got to be honest, living in the e- Xbox ecosystem, the majority, we had this conversation with Colin. Like I, I remember talking to him and he's like, look, during the PS3 era, all of IGN, they had nothing but 360s there. He was like one of the only guys. Like there's certain errors. Not, I'm not trying to say the tax and the bias in this case, but we have to be honest. There's certain errors that there is a dominant platform that everyone has. And the problem is people do not play on Xbox for the majority, right? So they don't know how truly great Pentium it is. They don't know how truly great, you know what I'm saying, Hi-Fi Rush. They're getting the taste of this for the first time in the ecosystem that they prefer to play. So now if you sit there and you go, oh, this is actually really good. This is great. Right. I like this. Yeah. Right. Now you go hope to Final Fantasy rebirth them <laughs> where you go. Oh, you like that? This is over here. Yep. Damn. And if you really like it, you're going to wait. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that you try to capitalize on the FOMO. So I do think they will a- attempt to do that. And to your point, I think they will capitalize on weaknesses, things that they want to be bigger that should have been better or should have been even more of an audience and get the awareness because the sad reality, I hate to say it, people ain't buying the console and they're not playing on the platform. So how do you get them? Put it on where they at. Mm. And now, now you go, we're going to learn with real data yeah. what that means. Mm. Do people wake up on that storefront and they go, yo, this see thing we're trying is kind of fire. Yo, grounded is, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're going to learn. We're going to learn yeah. so much. This is a very interesting time. Bro. I feel like you got to do your bigger games for that to be effective, though, is how I stand okay. on it. It's just talk um, to me. Talk to me. Yeah, no, I just, I mean, it's just that thought alone. It's like Pentiment and Hi Fi Rush and Grounded, even Sea of Thieves, I think you could argue, although it does pretty well, are like side pieces. Like, you know what the defining parts of your console are. And it is things like Starfield. And I think that was the original plan was like, yeah, we can't just do the core four here and, and 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 just act like this is the big to do it's like we need our biggest games over there because if we want to have a chance at dragging them in there it is those ten poles that were marketed heavily not the shadow drops not the the niche games that we did to to appease one of our best minds at a company that we bought recently like yeah we we kind of need to bring these bigger ones over and when the fan pushback was there then i imagine the plan changed a little bit based mm-hmm. on that and so kind of rocking a hard place when you commit to this because yeah. now the expectation is eventually it'll happen and yeah. i think if they want to extract the most success out of that potential game plan you need to bring your biggest games over if they yeah. if they if that is required to justify a sequel maybe starfield success is already justified enough support for example uh, maybe indiana jones will earn itself a sequel already on xbox we'll, we'll see how it goes but we'll see yeah it's yeah. a fine line it's a fine line and the last point i'll say is just that um you know 
they have to be also cognizant of as, also as a platinum, I mean, excuse me, as a platform mm. that has historically now missed out on releases from third party developers. If you go too aggressive with this strategy, right? You run the risk of like, hey, why do I really need to keep developing for you? Because everybody going to really stay over the Nintendo and Switch ecosystems. Yeah. You, you could further that gap. And I think they, they're concerned about not only the public perception, but, you know, developers and stuff like that. If, if it's not growing, it, it's, it's a tr- this is uncharted territory. I, I, I don't know how this plays out. That's why we got to watch. I cannot wait for like MPD next month. Do any of those games chart? Yeah, like that's gonna be yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. We gonna learn. We gonna learn. We gonna learn a lot. What, what's actually what? Got two more write-ins here, and we'll get into our one news bit. Monster Pont has ninety-three writes in. Hey, Duke boys, figured this could be a fun exercise to do. So, with games like Pentiment and Hi-Fi Rush, both single-player games, and Ground and Sea of Thieves live service games coming over to PlayStation, if the roles are reversed and PlayStation were bringing games over to Xbox, what two single-player and live service games? Would you like to have come over to Xbox? This is all fun and games, as this might not ever happen, or at least for a while. I figure this could be fun. Keep up the great work, gents. Three we- three weeks left until Paxies. Can't wait. Shout out to you, Ricky. Thank you for Salute writing in. Ricky. Cog. Mm. Does PlayStation... Even- this is a stupid question, because I know you'll correct me quickly, but does PlayStation even have like two live service games that we could pick <laughs> from? <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, saying that because I like how they do single player, but do they really have two... I mean, Live like, service. I, I guess. I mean, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it really. Hell Divers like, 2. Hell Divers <laughs> 2 is all that comes to mind right yeah. now. Um, uh, factions, that would have been one. That would have been one. Foam Stars is a technically a time exclusive. Is Grand, Grand Turismo? I guess Grand Turismo is yeah. live service. I guess. Yeah, I guess. Maybe. Yeah, they don't really. <laughs> yeah, I could pick single player games like that. Yeah, that's. What about Destruction? What was that, what was that one? Oh, Destruction All Stars. Yeah, that one. That one looked pretty good. I never played it, but I mean, the, yeah. the moment they did the, the the switch to, I think they were going to sell it, and then they went PS Plus. I was like, Plus? Oh, I was like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. That was, uh, Hell, they, 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 the the pre order numbers yeah. said, Hell no. <laughs> yeah, they like, We good. Let's get it yeah. into service. Um, Yeah, all I could think of is as far as to the question, shout out to Ricky. You, we met him at a, a PAX. Um, yeah, Hell Davis is on fire right now. You see the people out here making petitions. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so you got that. that. The other, the single player joints, you know, I want some Ghost of Tsushima. Mm, you want, <laughs> you want Sucker Punch to start making yeah. games for Xbox. Okay. Sucker Punch, come on over. You know, yeah. um, I mean, this done that stuff really, I don't see this happening anytime. Really. So, um, what's the other one I would say? Hmm. Give me one, because I, I, those are two I get for now. You got any one? Yeah, yeah. I would say I would pick a deeper cut one. Like I would, I would think it would be interesting to see like Kenna Bridge of Spirits, Mm, right? This is a PS5 exclusive. I think PC as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, But this was one that came out. I have it in my collection. I've yet to play it, but it came out and it was definitely like a fun artsy PS2 in design era experimental title. It's like, okay, Mm -hmm. cool. Uh, I don't know how it did, but but let's say it needed a little bit more to justify a sequel. Um, this would be a good candidate, I think, right? Okay. okay. You know, bring back that 3D yeah. platformer era. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would throw out there. This would be a bad candidate for Xbox, but oh. I would throw out maybe Gravity Rush 2 or Gravity okay. Rush in general. Um, that could be also pretty fun, in my opinion, because that is one that. I thought it was kind of underrated. Bit sent out to die, if you will, because I say that because the first one was on Vita, then it got remastered on PS4, and then they did like a whole on standalone release on PS4 for Gravity Rush 2. I feel like that series could have used a second chance, so maybe doing a collection re-release of that would be awesome. And I think the last one I'll throw out there is Concrete Genie. Like That's another one that I feel could deserve a second lease on life mm-hmm. uh, if they were kind enough to give it that. And so that would be another pick of mine. You know, the okay. core PlayStation franchises right now don't really need Xbox. It's Spider-Man, God of War. Like they're just selling stupid amounts. Although these core teams have suffered layoffs, unfortunately. So we'll talk yeah. about that in a moment. But um, yeah, I, f- I feel like there's a a number of uh, games that PlayStation can bring over that just kind of they didn't handle well themselves and, and could use a second lease on life. So, yeah, um, I would say, I, I don't know if they, this is even Sony control, but Genshin impact. Mm. 
that was one. one that, you know, what I'm saying, I let that one go. Yeah, let that one go, and then they made the deal. If there was any way that I could be a relationship could be opened up, that would be good. And then, um, hmm, I had a single player when I just lost the thought, but yeah, if, oh, I remember now. This would be a funny one. Oh, right. Bloodborne. Oh yeah, that, that, and then we were sixty frames. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, up. yeah, yeah, a little return fire there. Yeah, a little I like return that. fire. <laughs> there you go. I like that. That would actually be a pretty good one. I think uh, it just it's sitting there, man. Like that. Just, sitting. Got, I don't care if they release that on phones. Just give us the remaster, damn it! Like that is yeah. Where's the damn so, sixty to remaster? So overdue. Ooh. So overdue. Mm-hmm. I know Miyazaki recently just talked about it and said like he's happy people want it. So. Yeah, fingers crossed. He's not just happy, but they're doing something with it because that's like Elden Ring was money in the bank. Bloodborne is insane money in the bank, man. So yeah, let's cross our fingers. That's a good pick. That's a really good mm-hmm. pick. I'm trying to think. Is there anything else here? I guess because you mentioned Ghost of Tsushima, what if they just brought the multiplayer mode over? Oh, the last day. That is good. Actually, that was really good. That's really good. Yeah, I yeah, love Legends. that thing, man. That was that mm-hmm. was free. That showed up out of free. nowhere. Yeah, yeah, absolute. Good question, Ricky. Let's do one mm-hmm. more and we'll get into the news. Ian Williams writes in, greetings, good dukes. My question stems to you both regarding something that Phil spoke of during the business update, dual entitlement. I personally feel that given all of the challenges Xbox faces as a brand, that dual entitlement could be a key to the future. If we could purchase a game on either a console or via the Xbox app on PC, and pick up and play anywhere. You can do this with Game Pass titles now, but what about all games? This completely unlocks an entirely new way to interact with the ecosystem. If the rumors about a potential dockable Xbox handheld are true, that can almost be seen as a triple entitlement as you could play any game you purchase on the go, on the couch docked to your TV, or on your gaming PC. We'd love to hear your thoughts on whether you think this is something they'll pursue or not. Thank you both for the massive amount of work you put in to make a fantastic podcast each and every week. Thank you, Ian, for the kind and thoughtful writing here. Love. I really like this writing, Cog, because I don't think we yeah. really gave it enough attention. And I saw you point in the screen, so let's hear from you first. Dual mm-hmm. entitlement. Is this something Xbox should lean into? Yeah, they, they, they're kind of on the forefront of that. And I yeah. think that um, from verbally mentioning it and then, you know, with implementation on some of the titles. And I've always said this is the future of gaming, you know, especially with their mentality of where they want gaming to go as far as screens, mm-hmm. right? They want you on every screen, right? Yeah. So uh, wouldn't it be dope if every screen that you just purchased at one time, but you can take it to every, every screen. So yeah. yeah, this makes perfect sense. I, I've always given um, CD project red their props with the hailing of cyberpunk and the cross save situation. You know, yeah. um, I look at shout out to Larry and the way Baldur's gate three is handled perfectly. You know what I'm saying? I go from series S to rock ally PC back, you know, to, to my series X and that's the future. So again, if you want to be everywhere, you're going to have to put the things in place, from, and they've mentioned this in that those core tenets of what Xbox means right now, with cross save, cross play, and all that stuff. That's where it has to be, especially if you're going to be moving stuff over to PlayStation, right? Yeah. And now we're starting to see slower implement. We're starting to see some implementation of that, where some of these games you've got to create a Microsoft account. Mm-hmm. Some of these games to an- enable Thieves, cross save. Right? Yeah. See, if these is in there, I think there's one more that that um I'm not sure maybe grounded. It's, it's one more. I had it all listed out. I just don't have my notes in front of me with that. As far as the specifics on which of the games. But that's what it is. Because here's the thing. This is the Trojan horse. Because then it's like, oh, you got to create a Microsoft account. Now you're familiar with what that is. Right? And now you want to play with other people. I believe Minecraft has it as well. That That's what it's going to be about for them. So if this is going to be a success, I'm still going to be on them about that damn store, though. They're going to fix that damn mm. PC store and, you know, yeah. and Game Pass stuff. But if you have these basic features... It's going to be huge for you. That That's going to take this to the next level and make it seamless, make it very, you know, make it very tensionless where it's not a lot of hoops you got to go through to go through to activate these things. Yeah, man, you, you, you're you cooking. And that, I think, is the vision, right? Like the ability for Xbox to say, if it's on your phone, your dockable Xbox, whatever, your console, uh, your PC, uh, anything, we're just there. You buy the game once, that is a pretty good sales pitch for where gaming is going. Maybe not right now. I think it has a lot of uses right now, but it definitely is a good sales pitch moving down the stretch. If you know, it, it, I think it's sneaky. I would define, I would, I would connect it to uh, smart delivery. It's sneaky. Mm. Smart delivery was laughed at 
I joked about it. I'm like, what is this shit, man? Like, why are you guys yeah, hyping yeah, this up? That? But then your competitor showed why it was so good. And it was because it was so seamless. And Xbox understood, I guess, the complications of that, the pain in the ass it could be, whatever it may be. And they were like, let's make this easy. And it's one of the best features out of the box when the console generation had started, right? Uh, so I look at something like this where, you know, dual entitlement, of course, you know, and, and continuous entitlement across all these screens, of course. But then what happens when a company comes along and says, like, no, you bought it here on your PlayStation. You got to buy it here on whatever yeah. next device. Oh. Like, yeah, that, that ability to have it across the ecosystem can go an extremely long way in keeping people there because that ability to play anywhere is something like, I think right now about like Tekken. I know this is third party, so I'm, I'm a yeah. little bit out I'm of pocket, in your here. pocket right now. But yeah, yeah I know I'm me. talking to you. See, I know you yep. understand my language. Talking to me right I now. I like playing it on my TV, but I would love to play it on the go. And I would like to sometimes like I'm just at my PC and I, I want to use the dual screens. Like I would love to have it there. The ability to buy a game and just have it available across everything uh, in an ecosystem would be a huge win. I think it would be just for first party for Xbox. Yeah. But if that's a sort of future where like you log into your account and it's all there and that account could be available anywhere, you could stream that game that that would be awesome. And I think that would be a yeah. good leg up for Xbox to have as we transition toward that type of future yeah it's the future of gaming I've, I'm, I'm a firm believer and, and now that we've even getting them talk about the implementation of cloud with that right where now they want to have it where outside of game pass anything you own mm. has that ability to at least be even at minimum in the cloud that's the future they promote i think that's super dope i, I love that stuff man because it pains me right now yeah we have to buy tekken 8 again and now Story I ain't, ain't done on my rug ally, my costumes, and I'm big on my customers. Once yeah, I get into the customization's my, big, yeah. Getting into my customization so, bag. I spent so much time making Kevin Graham from Trails 3. I just I, <laughs> spent, like, I, was, I was getting my trails on. So now when I go online with Claudio, I'm beating people up with a trails character and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. <laughs> You're right. That is important though. That's stuff that you spend time doing and hey. if you share it across accounts, go a long way. Yeah, it kills me, man. So yeah, uh, salute to Xbox. This is the part where I really like how forward facing they are. And that's sure. why I still love the ecosystem. Sure. All right, Cog. Those are the putting quotes warm up questions. It's really our main topic of the show. Number one, layoffs have hit the entirety of the industry once more. Originally, it was just PlayStation in the headlines. But as we record this episode, the story is developing with EA, where we've learned that they've canceled respawns first person Star Wars game, which had previously been reported to be a Mandalorian Bounder Hunter game that we talked about last week. We were really hyped about that. But uh, yeah, the, the Battlefield Studio Ridgeline Games has been shut down. Some of that staff has been folded into Ripple Effect. Uh, Danny Isaac and Darren White at Criterion will oversee the single player work on that series. Um, we have Mark Leto, who had left recently from the uh, Battlefield team. There's a lot ongoing, man, here, and we're, we're seeing cuts all over the board. EA is reportedly stepping away from licensed work. Uh, the layoff total, I'll get the number in a sec, but I know for PlayStation, it was over 900, and that affected big studios like Insomniac Games, which we can clearly tell by the unfortunate Insomniac hack. That, um, yeah, that's a big part of their, their success moving forward. We have a write-in here from John Gottfried. I'll pass it to you, Cog. Greetings to the incomparable Cog and meticulous Maddie. Fellas, news is now coming out about the large swath of layoffs throughout many of PlayStation Studios. Heavy hitter studios like Naughty Dog and even Insomniac aren't spared from this, with so many companies in the gaming industry recently laying off massive amounts of employees. I'd like to hear your take on this new information. To me, it truly feels like a trimming the fat era due to overhiring in the COVID years. If a company that releases a great game like Spider-Man 2 isn't safe, then there has to be an overarching reason throughout gaming and tech industry for all of this. What's your guys' take? Thanks for all that you do and keep it up. Cog, lots of layoffs again, unfortunately. The number continues to surge way past everything we saw combined last year. Whether it's PlayStation or EA, you kind of choose where you want to start. Um, go ahead. Stage is yours. I think I'll start with PlayStation because um, this, this hits hard for me because as a person who really grew up with PlayStation 1, I know, like, that's probably... I'm probably weird. PlayStation was like one of my favorite PlayStation consoles of all time. Um, Cause they were just new. They were, they were aggressive. They were the new kid on the block. They had these diverse games and then they, you know, it's the launch of the CD era. This launch of kind of like where uh, consoles now have reached arcade level 
and if mm. not surpassed it and stuff like that. So SIE is really home for me. I mean, it's hard for me because I was a huge Wipeout fan. And I remember like, you know, the Liverpool studios and, and things that, like the UK Sony scene was huge for me. And the fact that they were, the, the Japanese Sony scene. So yeah. we saw initially before these layoffs, they had shuttered and went away from Sony Japan studios. And mm. then now this, this is literally the gutting of SIE. And I guess why a lot of this is surprising to me is because in the PlayStation 4 era, that's where like they got established their dominance, you know what I'm saying? Over Xbox and they really grew in the territory. So this is sad. This is sad. And it just, I think my overall arching comparison to what's going on, you know, with this industry is that we're, le- we're learning a lot. We're learning, obviously, from the Xbox standpoint, they had to make pivots, right? They, whether internally or not, they didn't reach their internal targets, whether it be Game Pass subscribers and the subscription market aspect, they're failing it, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about now the Insomniac leaks, and it was blatantly said, these budgets are way out of control. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. I'm a guy that loves the hashtag just one and realizes that it's just not sustainable. And it's something that Sean Layden has been saying for the longest. Yeah. These games are way too expensive. Cost, and here's the thing, you know, they take so long to make. That's the other thing, right? Yeah. So you can't afford for these games to be, you know, flopping. So to me, here's the thing. And I think it's kind of what, uh, what you call it? Um, This is from Herman House at the, the statement. He said, you know, PlayStation's in their fourth year. He said, at the same time, our industry has experienced continued and fundamental change which affects how we all create and play in games. Delivering these immersive, narrative-driven stories that PlayStation Studios is known for at the quality we aspire to requires a re-evaluation of how we operate. That is Sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds very familiar. Delivering and sustaining these will allow PlayStation gamers to explore different worlds as well as, here's the key on the second part, launching games on additional devices Mm -hmm. as PC and mobile requires a different approach and different resources. So what are we seeing as the theme here, right? We're seeing we need to get wider than just the console market and we need to change what we're doing. It's not working right now in conjunction with what I've always been saying in reference to a COVID era where there was all this over forecasting, yeah. right? So it's all these things compounding. And I spoke to a lot of people behind the scenes and I didn't want to believe it at first, but they were like, oh, they were telling me since a year and a half ago, like the way this thing, we're heading towards a crash if things don't change. And I'm like, nah, I was like, it can't be that serious. But bro, what was it? We're not even, February's yeah. about to end. We just now in February, that gamesindustry.biz article is uh, looking looking like it's evergreen. They said it was a, the year of closures. We're seeing that, seeing tons of layoffs. I mean, sorry, continue, but just no, get, no, preach, preach. You preach it like that. That that's just what it is. And it just, <sighs> I just look at this. You know, obviously, you know, it hits hard when you know, literally, Insomniac, who's had PlayStation on their back. Yeah. Yeah. And we hear about the how much consoles are sold. How many, how many Spider-Mans are sold? And it ain't enough. <laughs> and then Sony is still talking about, hey, we, we we should be getting way more bigger profit margins than what we're getting and stuff like that. So, yeah, this is an industry. I'm not trying to just target places. This is also an industry problem. This is big. We're at an inflection point and it, and it looks like we're in course correction mode right now. And maybe it's another year, you know, of, of, of this before it starts to to settle. But yeah, this is discouraging. This is discouraging for as big as 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 profitable as this business is. We can't retain talent, you know. I can't, in good faith, as a person who was recently in the games industry, can't recommend someone coming into this industry. Can you yeah. really recommend someone at make the, like, so much money, have one of your biggest years, and then layoffs? Yeah. Boom. And that was the beauty of the insomnia leaks because we knew this was coming. They were like, yo, remember they found out through the leaks. Yeah. Oh, yo. You know, it, it, it's it's fortunate. It's unfortunate. And I just think of, you know, all the people who are now scrambling, right? Right now. Yeah. You know what that feeling is. It, it's tough. But what, what's your overall, what's your top level thoughts on on this? And were you surprised? Like, you know, how you, no. how you this? Yeah. Un- unfortunately, not surprised. Yeah. EA was a little bit of a whoa where that come from? Because EA, we have a lot more details on it seems like a lot of what playstation is doing is similar to xbox but with 
EA, I just saw the number, it was over 650. And it looks like they're stepping away from licensed stuff. Like we saw already, they walked away from FIFA. They let that go, right? For EA Sports Football Club. They just shut down a Star Wars game. They didn't like the Star Wars license. Like these licenses, I know a lot of people think it's like a handshake, but they, they have to pay money to use these licenses. And that ups the demand of what a game has to do. Now, they're lucky they have something like a a trilogy in the making here with the star wars jedi series that's monumentally successful uh, but ea is definitely walking away from licensed stuff like they didn't do battlefront 3 because they decided to do battlefield 2042 and i know 2042 is in a better spot now but they that will forever it. upset me because we have not still got battlefront 3 even with a new start we have not got to battlefront 3 and that is a that is a game alongside the me half-life 3 that like just deserves to exist like it just has to exist but it, it feels like it never will uh because now we're probably at the brink of starting over again um yeah it's frustrating but on the front of the layoffs doesn't surprise me to see that more happening as we continue to really regulate how the business needs to be run and hopefully next time we see a surge in profits and playability there's a little more responsibility in hiring up and understanding that uh, something like the covid bubble would pop. I don't know if I, these shareholders must have been so convinced that like that was going to be it oh, forever. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't get the mindset, but I, I've already oh, yeah. said that point. Sorry, you were about to say something else. No, I, I think the other thing that we can't overlook is that, you know, and again, I'm not trying to point the finger, but we're also talking about studio closures. That's a big deal. Yeah. You close in the entire, you know, London studio, like that's a big deal, you know. Um, that, that's the part that bothers me the most. It's just like, man, you know, you know, layoffs will happen at some point, but it's just the sheer volume that we have. And then you compound, compound that with that. It is just like, where do we go from here? But yeah, I mean, I, not too much to add on this. It's, it's just, it's very disappointing. And obviously Microsoft would have had 1900, you know, earlier this year, this is, you know, in a post um, ABK merger kind of situation, we have this. So, you know, I don't want to get in this tit for tat thing, but I just want to be clear that when people would tell me, oh, one way is the right way to do things, right? Mm -hmm. That's not true. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, both sides are affected. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's not stopping. That's the thing. There's no, oh, yeah, now it's, we're clear now and the rest of 2020. We don't have any indicators just yet, right? Yeah. So the other thing we have to say is there's going to be pivots. There's going to be pivot in game development. You know, maybe now the double A becomes more attractive. You know, the the indies get a little bit more love. You know, what we're seeing is that these games are just way too expensive. The prices are not going up as far as, let's be honest, in reference to inflation, you know, whether it be there, it's negatively looked upon to say, hey, we're going to charge $80, $90 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it comes down to what Phil said. It's like, are you going to either a over monetize the same group that you've been selling to or look to expand? And that's why I keep telling people, I don't know why is this foreign thing that like, oh, the PlayStation would never put their stuff on PC and Xbox would never get ready. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, open your eyes. Like this stuff's happening. These people ain't just talking. This is money and revenue and people want bottom lines and overall profit you got people could get caught up with the revenue all day and how much consoles are sold all day what's the profit yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm what's the return then you starting to see oh we didn't we didn't get that we didn't make that oh change is going to be made mm -hmm. and i think that's what gamers have to really pay attention to so yeah we're, we're definitely in an inflection point in the industry it is yeah. it's crazy yeah and and you mentioned uh, insomniac not being safe another one being like respawn not being safe and having oh. a game cancel like if you're gonna lean if you're ea and you're gonna lean into any team it's probably mm -hmm. respawn right like they're yeah. they were the they're the sole reason ea started to believe in single player again like you think if anyone's gonna get a game canceled it's not them so not them you're seeing the the prime companies across the board that just should be completely untouched are the ones that are even being deeply affected by this and it just shows where we're at economically and um i actually i just made a video before mm -hmm. all these layoffs happened so i think it's kind of aged really well quickly it's called gaming's complicated future and i usually don't like promote my stuff in a way where i'm like hey please go check this out i kind of i'll mention it in passing but um if anyone's gonna watch a video from me i hope that's one they check out because at first it was a video i was never gonna make and now i'm so happy i made it not just because of what news has happened but it, I think captures really well a lot of my thoughts on where we're headed, which is I think a lot of people are very like dismal on where we're going and 
it's going to be bad, you know, bad, 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 negative, negative, negative. And I think there's a lot of pros to it. Like right now, um, I'll bring up a talking point from the video. Look at the biggest games right now. What are they? Power World, Power Hell Divers 2, Hell Divers and Shrouded, True. Last Shrouded. Epoch. What are all these teams similar in? Independent, like double A, small. Look at the failures this year. Skull and Bones, right? Look at the failures this year. Suicide Squad. Look at the absolute distrust people have with AAA. I think the consumer's waking up, pivoting away from those types of experiences. Games, we're not, we're no longer having, there was a period of time you would have those games that looked like bona fide flops, but the wool was pulled over the eyes enough where companies got out in time. Like they, they got it out, they got enough sales, they got their money, and they kind of escaped, right? That's not happening anymore. The biggest games are cheaper. The biggest games are more creative. The biggest games don't make false promises. The biggest games are over-delivering, not under-delivering and charging you more. That's what the biggest games are. And I think these big... Pla- I, I, I'm going to continue to beat the drum based on a write-in as well that we got last week that, that worded as the red herring. And it was a good way of putting it. I think this whole breaking down the barriers thing is a big red herring and an excuse to this repeat this process when we get big again. So we're going to knock these walls down. We're going to put our games everywhere. We're going to grow. We're going to overhire again. And when we overhire, we're going to lay everyone off again. And then we're going to monetize the shit out of everything that's out there now because you have the biggest pool imaginable. Either way, they're going to hit a brick wall. There's going to be a point where growth is extremely limited. And when that happens, you're going to go back to the same solution that's always been there since this moment in time now, which is you've got to make smaller, cheaper games. You've got to start finding studios in places that aren't like California, New York. You got to start building studios in places that it doesn't cost like fucking $8,000 a month to live there. Like you got to start building out teams in those smaller locations. Those are ways we can grow gaming and make games economically and stop making everything endless. Stop making everything live service. (laughs) These games that are succeeding are the ones that are not making these promises of infinite games have to end. And that's something that I think the biggest of budgets are missing or they're spending too much time on. And I get perfecting it. I'm not asking for lesser quality, but there has to be something to give here. Smaller Mm. games from known teams. I don't mean to, I'm not trying to beat the Microsoft war drum. I'm not saying Pentiment's a great financial example, but I look at that and, and I think to myself, something that would fit more of Obsidian's approach, like, if they made a game like Forgotten City, right? Smaller, really choice based, less combat oriented, just dialogue. It was like a smaller experimental thing. That's something that could easily blow up for them. Or it doesn't have the pressure of needing to blow up. Look at what we read about WB, where they're like, our games business is in for a rough year because Suicide Squad was a colossal failure, pretty much. It's like, okay, what if we didn't just put ourselves in these positions and put all our chips on the table for one game? Just like we're seeing across the industry. Look at THQ. They put all their chips on the table for one deal. One deal worth a lot of money, mind you. It falls to the floor and look at how many studios got shut down. People got fired. Games in jeopardy. Games canceled because we keep putting our chips on the table for the one big bet. We're not making games intelligently, in my opinion. You have to start going back. Double A and indie are not just the path, the trailblazers so that triple A can copy the ideas like they're now leading in, in money made. They're leading in sales. They're they're not just leading in creativity anymore. It's a very different landscape now. And I'm afraid not to, to sound like a fear monger, but I am afraid that this industry is not just waking up and smelling the roses, which is whether it's now or you break down all these barriers, games are everywhere. You are going to run into the same economic issue again. And when you get there, you're going to have to go back to this point where not everything has to be small, but you need to make more smaller games, more cheaper games, games with smaller timelines. Not everything needs a million in delays and needs to be gargantuan. Start rescoping games. Start making them smaller. You can still make them like replayable, like 10 hour replayable game. Uh, Hi-Fi Rush is a good example of that. Hi-Fi mm-hmm. Rush, you know, replayable. It's 10 hours. You know, you don't, there's less to test. There's less to comb over. There's less content there. It's just, I'm not acting like it's simple. It's much more difficult than I'm proposing, yeah. but I just feel like we're at this inflection point, as you said, and we're not, seeing it for what it is. Many of these shareholders are saying, well, okay, to keep doing what we're doing now, let's just fucking blaze it all down and just monetize. And it's like, yeah, that's one way of doing it. But when you knock that wall down, you're at the end of that road. What are you going to do again? And mm. I think you, you're just going to either, like I said last week, 
microtransactions across all these games because that's a no fucking brainer in my opinion <laughs> no brainer in my opinion for the big mm-hmm. platform holders big companies by the way i'm talking yeah. about i think again indie double a i think they'll lead the charge and not do this shit but uh, you, you're trying to tell me that like once uh, a shareholder sees oh we're <laughs> uh, we have instead of reaching you know a couple you know, 10 couple dozen million players now we reach the whole fucking globe and if we put a, a single five dollar t shirt in here, if like <laughs> a million people buy that because we have a bigger pool of players, like we can make five. Like, oh, it's a no brainer. I'm not gonna pretend that's not gonna happen because it's so mm. smart. Yeah, so I mean, of course, we're 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 tr- we're trending that way, right? And I just think not to get on my soapbox, but w- we need more people rethinking how games are made because the shareholders don't make games; they make money. And right. so they're not right. thinking on that level. And so it's up to the people who are leaving these big companies and, and, and making these games that have to lead the charge in where things are going because the fans are supporting it. That's what's speaking the most to me. That's no, enough for me, though. Sure. I'd love to hear you, please. <laughs> no, no, I, I get where you're coming from. I, I think that the smaller games argument is valid. I think that, um, you know, we have to look at as much as I love Mia, AAA you know, insane experience, you know, what it's doing to the industry. And like I said, the I think we're seeing signs, though. I think because when you see Insomniac, again, those leaks were very, very vital yeah. in the sense of learning how corporations think. And they started to talk about and flirt with the idea of the $50 price point, but a smaller thing and splitting the game up, right? Mm. And then we look at, fast forward to on the Xbox side, we look at what Hellblade 2, we were both surprised, like, oh, wow, they're not charging 70 for that. Oh, wow. You know, it's not going to be this super long, crazy experience, you know, 30 plus hour, you know, it's going to be in the vein of this. So I'm thinking we're, we're starting mm-hmm. to see certain core course corrections and they have to. I mean, otherwise this industry is, it will go under. You know, I'm old enough to know about, you know, the time there was a, a video game crash, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. during the Atari era. Like it happened. It can happen. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's a combination of that. I think it's, um to your point, I know your concern is more that once things start going everywhere, they're going to go back to the status quo of business as usual and, and not learn from it. I think that the industry right now is showing the harsh realities that if you don't, it will crater. It, it just, it's not, Sean Layden said it bad. It's just not sustainable. It's just not. And as much, as much as I love those experiences, the bigger games, stuff like that, we can't have everyone trying to hit these home runs out of the park. Sometimes a double is okay. Sometimes mm-hmm. a single up the middle is okay. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You yeah. Know, it's every, a Bronx Bombers type it's, mentality, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's low to base. It. No, we're not moving the runner over. I got to use baseball yeah. acknowledges. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, we, everything is we going for the big megaton swing. And then when you fail, you're out of the league. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? As opposed yeah. to not everyone's going to have the 50 home run season. So, yeah, that, that's that's what it is. And um, we're starting to see a trend. But, yeah, this is unfortunate. You know, I, I hate to to see any of this stuff, especially for an industry I love, you know. Hundred percent, and I, you know, I hope it gets better. But um, I just, you know, once I think we're in for another high. Like I said, as we knock down those those walls and as games sell more, you know, gaming is so big that it, the the testament you can say is that these AAA have have grown gaming so much that the AA and the indies are no longer these tucked away hidden gems, and they can thrive in the way they have. Like that's the purpose mm-hmm. they serve, right? Um, you know, it's growing this industry. So they're needed and they're important. I just, you know, yeah. I hope that we're responsible when the money comes in again, that it's war chested instead of like spent on bloating teams and having yeah. to lay off a ton. Because uh, there was a great article from Jason Schreier talking about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and its development cycle. And he asked a question yes. that we've only been able to ask one other team. And that was the team that just faced a canceled game and layoffs respawn. Mm-hmm. Hey, how did you make Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, by the way, a game that, as someone who's played a lot of it, infinitely bigger and better than Remake? How did oh, wow. you make this in four years? And the answer was, we kept our talent. 80 to 90% of the team was retained. Mm. And that built-in knowledge goes a super long way. Like right now, where I'm at in my game, if we had to replace our programmer or something, I'd be like, what the fuck? Did we? Like, that's so much Think built-in it. knowledge. You that's the thing that sucks about these layoffs that I know a lot of people are like, Oh, whatever layoffs happen all the time. It's the built in knowledge that's lost that hurts games. And it's why these timelines are getting longer. And it's why people are trying to preach the please and the layoffs because games are going to come out less and they're going to come out worse because you're going to have more confusing situations where again, I'll go back to suicide squad. Like 
how some decisions got made, you just don't feel the rock steady DNA there in some instances. And that's because of a loss of talent. And when that talent's lost, they're just not making the same concise design decisions that you saw in a whole trilogy of Batman games. So that's what happens. It's frustrating. You got me thinking too, and thinking about our beloved Bioware, right? Oh, it's perfect just example. Not, yeah. Right? Was, yeah. Perfect example. Yeah. Perfect Use example. That talent and look at yeah. KOTOR, Mass Effect, and look what comes of it with Anthem yeah. and Andromeda. It's just right. a totally different ballgame, right? You're, you're cooking the retaining of talent and, and having that those that studio cohesion and also a lot too much outsourcing sometimes and contractors and you know what I'm saying? That's another part. Three, four, three and Xbox. You, a, you know, we well, gotta talk about it, right? This is again. I, I think you're cooking. I, I think these are all valid points and we, we have to, as an industry, and we got to talk about unionization or some level protection, something yeah, like, huh, it's tough, man. You people just losing their gigs and, and, and these are people. And that, well, last thing I had to mention, because you, you talked about, it can't be just California or whatever. Like even in New York, there's really no, I, I talked to, you know, I'm obviously I'm part of New York Video Games Critics Circle. I've worked with, you know, people behind the scenes and I'm talking like, why is it, it's such an issue? You get no tax breaks, bro. Mm. No yeah. tax breaks to make a studio in, in New York. Like that, you can't incentivize, you know what I'm saying? People to do that. Yeah. The industry has to change. You know, the, these are, this is as big as the entertainment field. So this is where the politics aspect has to get it. Like things have to, to change in order. We can't be having people move their whole life and they have to go to, you know, only San Francisco or only LA, you know what I'm saying, to a studio or um, Seattle or Washington. And then it doesn't work out. You've transported your whole life and you don't have a lot of options to go. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, man. And then now, obviously now remote work is less thing. I, I saw Jason Schreier put out a tweet now that, um, uh, what you call is demanding people to go back to the office now. Um, was it, uh, what you call rockstar just put something out. It's, Wow. The industry, it's a rough industry, man. I, as much as I love it and I want to get back into it again, it's hard for me to sit there and realistically say, hey, guys, this is the time. Jump in. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is it, y'all. Come yeah. on. It's tough. Yeah, it is. It is. It's unfortunate. So our, our best wishes, if anyone's listening yeah. and worked at PlayStation or um, and yeah. worked at a yay, you know, best wishes. We hope you land on your feet yeah. and that, that this slows down and that we, we learn from all of this. Last thing on what I want to people to do, Signal boost opportunities. I think Laren, Laren just put something out just now, like, hey, we're looking for da 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 for people affected. Just signal boost as much as you can. You never know who that could help, you know, as far as people that are actually looking yeah. at have that skill set that may be at another, you know, there's another opening somewhere else. 100%. That's it for the news. Not much else happened this week otherwise. And so we move from that to our Game Pass pick of the week, or is it, Cog? Let's. Here we you we, we game plan this one we strategize a little bit so I, I would like to, just go ahead take it away I'm I'm very Let's curious go. how you handled this one <laughs> yeah man so you know I had a conversation this is something we always do it, it it what it is is I'm in this weird pocket that every I'm playing so many games and none of them are game or game pass you know playing ten Xbox games but the games I'm playing are not a, a game pass right so I'm like all right obviously it's my turn coming up so I'm like a week ago I'm like all right let me see what I'm gonna mess around with. And I downloaded on my hard drive something that I've been dying. I've avoided when it was in the zeitgeist. And now I'm like, you know what? It's been in Game Pass for a while. Let me check this out. So that game was Gotham Knights. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. I've heard about all the issues. You know, Cog is a superhero kind of guy. Like, you know, DC, let me see what's going on. And I think this is going to be the first Game Pass dodge of the week. <laughs> I can't, man. I tried. I tried. I tried, bro. Like, here's the thing. The game starts off, and this is no spoiler by now, but people should know, like, yo, like, Batman is no longer with us. And there's a reason, right? And I thought that was handled cool. I was like, all right. They start, you know, a new age of heroes. They're going to take up the mantle. You know, it was explained well. And here's the thing. What I like about the game initially was I like the detective aspect of stuff. Mm. Like I was, I picked Nightwing off the jump. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to fuse clues together to get to a decision to move past the next thing. The first thing I got to notice off the bat is we knew it was going to be 30. But it's still a jittery, framey. It's not that rebirth. It's not that Starfield thirty. It's it that Starfield there's, thirty. There's, there's, there's different breeds to that thirty, man. I'm telling Bro, you. Bro, this is a really janky thirty, and I'm yeah. not the, you know, technical performance 
person where I can notice very easy. I'm noticing with Gotham. So that was the first thing. Yeah. Then, you know, the traversal is very simple. You do your little love bump or, you, you know, you, you, you lasso, you grapple around. Yeah, what stuff. do you think of that little web swinging mechanic? They kind of <laughs> Bro, even the gliding in that game feels horrible. Horrible. But you know where it really, I turn, I'm going to tell you this when I got to, right, so I'm like, all right, God, no, still, it's cool. You know, we're moving around. I'm Nightwing. I'm in my superhero bag. Then he's like, all right, fight now. Go fight. Go fight now. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, this is mad Low and clunky and the animations is repeated. And look at me I, looking at me like a fist fight in MSG, man. Just like yeah, no <laughs> punch. <laughs> Yo, you stupid. <laughs> no impact, no MSG impact, no rages <laughs> impact. I'm like, bro, this seems like first I feel like I'm in molasses. Then nothing has no impact. Then I like to fight the boss, it's like hold down the button and take the shield off the dude. And I was just like, no. I was like, yeah. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I, I tried. I, I, I put in a couple hours. It got to the point with the map. Well, then I got to the bike part. That didn't feel that good. Yeah, either. the bike. Oh, God. I was like, no. And I wanted to like you. I, I waited. I was like, by now, all things should be fixed. Yeah. It should be settled. I thought, I'm a little surprised. I, I did think you would enjoy it more than most. Like, when I made my video about Iron Richard Rebound ahead of Suicide Squad coming out, I made that video. I said, like, I'm preparing my body for the worst, <laughs> is what I said. And going back to it, like, because when I played it for my review, I was like, yeah, it's just like, isn't it? But like, there was a lot of, I always talk about how the zeitgeist can like influence your opinion, even yeah. if you don't want it to. Like, there's just like that momentum that's yeah. carried with particular takes. And I was like, all right, let me see if like I got caught up. Like, let me see if I, if it, if it just, I was ready for bad and I, I, I deep down wanted bad. And I played it again. I was like, this is terrible. I was like, this, yeah. this feels horrible to play. What did you think of the whole Belfry Tower system? Like you go out for the night and you do. I kind of thought that was an interesting it idea, was, but it just it was like, interesting. Like unlocking fast travel points with like the yeah, little it was a thing. Bro, what the <laughs> hell was that? I was like, how do you fuck this up? I don't like the ca- just the basic camera and movement doesn't feel smooth. Yeah. Like it yeah. really doesn't. It doesn't feel good to play. That was what messed me up. See, my thing is I don't care about frame rate as long as it feels good, it's impactful, and it's responsive. And I felt like the delay in response and just simple things as far as like lo- like vaulting onto something mm. and jumping, it just didn't feel good. And and you know me, I'm a person. If I like a superhero, I will I will push through. Like I'll tell you this, <laughs> Avengers play way better than this. Mm. Avengers play way better than this. Man. And I know y'all are, a lot of people are not a fan of that game, but at least on a core level, you know what I'm saying? I was like, yeah. okay, cool. And it was smooth, you know, kind of thing. So yeah, I, I tried, got the nice. You know, I don't want to I didn't want to do disrespect y'all like this, but it was just nothing that really piqued my interest. And I really wanted to love you. Like I really came in like yeah, son, I'm going to get the best version. I waited. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nah, nah. Now, I will say this. In, uh, here's the silver line, I, which I haven't tried yet. Mm. Uh, PC Master Race owners, maybe for y'all. I, I have to see. I, I do need to give it a try to see if, because this is just, I'm just talking about the Series X version is what I play. I have not played it on my rig, the big boy. You know what I'm saying? Because I got the NZXT jump off. Um, I'm all the way live, equivalent, almost like a 4080, 4090 voice. So I, I, maybe for the PC community, it's there. But for the yeah. console, guys, I cannot recommend. Not, not on console. Yeah, it's just not. Even if the framework was better, you, you mentioned game feel and like that's a big part of Gotham Knights problems. It, yeah. Have you surfed those menus, man? Like just the the materials like that's why I was wondering. I was like, am I just not enough of a live service head? But hearing you say it shouldn't no. tell everyone and what they need to know. Remember, I'm the live service guy. I'm yeah. the guy who is more empathetic to those type of systems. Sure. And legendary and this and that. Yeah. It just it just didn't come together for me. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it just a, a, a nice attempt but I mean the concept. I like the idea of what yeah. they were trying to do, right? What did you but play I did, as, by the way, real quick? Oh, the, Nightwing. I had to go with Nightwing. I had to do my oh, double yeah, bolo. Right. Sorry, to do yeah. my joint. You know, what I'm saying yeah. whatever, whatever. But no, you know, it just it just, it just ain't work out this week for yeah. me. Oh, game pass picking. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I did Batgirl when I played. Oh and, yeah, uh, I see. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, some of the mm. some of the skins they give you are, are pretty cool. Um, I enjoyed those. They're, the game really like the idea. I was the defender of that game when they first announced it, and they're like, "Oh, here we go, another Avengers." I'm like, "No, no, no it's co-op. It's an action yeah. RPG. It's a whole different beast that can actually be pretty good." Is it Arkham? Mm-hmm. No, but I'm okay with that. Like, because the last WB game we got was Arkham Origins, and that was yeah. 
really good. Yeah, it was good. I felt like this should have been great, but uh, the writing in that game is is infuriating, man. Mm-hmm. I like that was my beginning of the crusade against AAA video game writing and really just writing game quality in general. I was just like, no, no, like we have hit a rock bottom, like a, a pit that I never thought we'd reach. I need to start bringing attention to just how terrible it is. And like, that was the, that was my breaking point. That game. Yeah. I orched that game for its fucking writing. It was terrible. So yeah. Did the, you find the, any of the story elements in, intriguing beyond like the death of Batman? And yeah, that, and then Batman obviously Batman. development of the characters. I, I'm going to be honest though. The best part of the game for me is the playing from an investigative and stealth standpoint. Yeah. It That's gets like when I enjoyed the game the cool. most. Yeah. And then, then you put on the little the visor. You, you're doing the clues. They did a good job. Wish, it, they, they would have went deeper into that. It just made it like the stealth, and you can't take yeah. on a whole bunch of people because you're not Batman. So, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So and, yeah. and just dive into that because when they tried to be like, oh, we could do all this stuff too, or we could fight, and we, it wasn't really the combat. Mm. Really didn't sit with me, but I sure. love the investigated. I love detective, and, and that was I thought was the strength of the game. What I played, yeah. that I enjoyed. I agree. So mm-hmm. there you go, ladies and gentlemen, your first ever Game Pass Dodge of the Week. Get out of the way. Go play something hold, else. Hold that circle button and move on. <laughs> <laughs> Who would that be? All right. We got one final question and we're out of here, Cog. It comes from Dylan. Dylan writes, hello, fellas. With the summer showcase rapidly approaching, I was wondering if you think we'll have another single game direct like last year with Starfield. I've seen a lot of people say that Fable would be the game, but in my opinion, State of Decay would be great for that type of deep dive. Your thoughts. Thanks as always. And have yourself an A1 day. Thank you, Dylan, for writing in. This is a good question because now that we're away from it all, do you think that with the... I think it was a great call, by the way, because it clearly worked out. Starfield was successful. Was, do you think that it was too much, though? There was a degree of like... I remember going from that showcase to Starfield. There was that feeling of like overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And that was a good feeling because mm-hmm. Xbox fans don't get to feel overwhelmed often. Mm-hmm. But do you think this is a strategy they deploy more often or a one-time thing? Because I was looking at you know the developer direct slate. I'm like, Indie? Indie could get itself a nice direct pretty long if the game isn't too short. Because Machine All Games right. has made short games in the past. I'm like, mm-hmm. Indie would be a good pick. Yeah, Indie would be good. I couldn't really see it. All right, like I just, but Fable is a good, that is a good pick. I feel like that is, I've said on the show before, I think that's the next big one for Xbox. If you're trying to like mark on your calendar, what's the next Zeitgeist game? You said the same. It's got to be Fable, right? It's got to be. There's a lot of anticipation for this one. Yeah. Yeah. To me, I look at the three Zeitgeist games that qualify for that would be Hellblade 2, but the problem is it's coming out for the showcase and it's going to be out already we've seen a bunch of it so that's out yeah indie we did see a lot at the developer direct that means, right? yeah. so it's like part of me is like well and then you made your point about you know machine games being shorter so maybe you know they don't give us that add-on remember th- what we talk about is that add-on where you have the showcase and then you have a game that just gets its own thing Fable makes sense, but the only reason why I have to push back on the Fable thing is that I feel a developer direct of that nature makes sense if you're getting the game in the release year that it's dropping. To do that level of extension with Fable and then you're not getting it in 2024, mm. to me, you, you save me this year. Okay. Yeah. So to me, if you give that energy to you know developer direct to next year when it drops, hopefully next year. So I'm going to say none this year. They're just going to do a traditional show. Yeah. I mean, you think they're going to do a Call of Duty? <laughs> they're going to do it. Lord, Lord the, help me. The, if that's going to turn into man. But what if it's final? What if, what if it's the Black Ops we dreamed of? <laughs> and we go, oh, y'all. <laughs> I know I can't thank Xbox for that because that shit had to be in development for years before. For I mean, it sounds pretty cool because they said they're leaning into, number one, I'd love Black Ops. And you're leaning into the open world stuff. And I was like, yo, a Halo Infinite style kind of Call of Duty campaign could go a long way. So I was hoping MW3 would be, but that yeah. to me at least on this show yeah. was not was not the case. But yeah, I, I agree that the I, I I was losing focus of the initial question. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if they do a big one this year. I think Starfield, yeah. they clearly saw the writing on the wall, like this is a big game. There's a lot of yeah. anticipation. We have a lot of questions to answer. And I don't know if a game on if you're not Starfield. Could and could go that long. 
Starfield just Good had point. so many questions surrounding it, and I think I they did a great job answering it all. It doesn't mean oh. that you had to love the game coming out of it, but mm-hmm. I just think Starfield had so many question marks oh. surrounding it. So, yeah, yeah, man, I, I really think you look at it. If, if Fable's coming sooner than we think, like let's like I see see the reason I think that's going to get a deep dive is Matt Booty. I think this oh, game yeah. will single handedly oh. put in the stamp and say like, Bro. hey, that shit's getting a direct. I want everyone to see how good this game is because he's he is hyped this thing up a ton where he just anytime he can talk about like, oh, yeah, Fable. Absolutely. Like anytime, any single yeah, time. Yeah. So I feel it's going to get one this year, though. I think you're you're on the money. I don't know if there's a candidate right now. Indy would be the best pick, but I don't know if Indy would be showing too much if it went on. Too right. Long. That's the thing. And, and I think it, we Starfield was just a perfect storm because we just didn't know what Starfield was. And to this day, you know, what I mean, people going, listen, I still feel it's the that direct of Starfield is the best showing of a video game. I left <laughs> completely like I know what the hell it is. This is amazing. All the play styles, all the thing. Like I, I was it was and it was needed because remember, it was just so many. They would be so vague with Starfield prior to that point, you know, yeah, kind of thing. So, so. Yeah, for people were frustrated. Like, what is it? What do you do? Yeah, that kind of, and, and that was fair, you know what I'm saying? Kind of thing. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm with you. I think yeah, I also want to double down on your point. I think that with next year, Fable is tied to Matt Booty. Like, I think Fable, we're gonna learn a lot. If Fable knocks it out the park, he he, he his stature is gonna rise because then he's like, okay. game for him. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so. I think it's tied, it represents you know, new Xbox, that perfect dark. We got to see. There's a couple that to me represents new Xbox. And if they land it, then that puts him in a favorable state. Yeah. But we go, okay, we trust you with the class of 2018. You understand what quality, yeah. you know, kind of means. So yeah, they've got, they got some pressure this year, but I think basic showcase, they got a ton to talk about. They seem pretty excited. I mean, he's already said with 10 games. So for me, yeah. I'm like loving, like, Outside of, I know there's a lot of drama behind this third party stuff, but if you look at it objectively, what's coming for Xbox, I'm super excited. Yeah, like I haven't been more here. excited for the platform. Ten games coming. Like I'm 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 ready. Let's go. Yeah. And it's crazy because as the months wane on, like we really don't know. It seems like they're all mostly second half stuff, right? Like we Yeah, outside of yeah, what you call it? Uh what's a Hellblade? I don't know if we consider it. Yeah, just yeah, sneaking man. into yeah. the first half. So yep. yeah, I'm really keen to, to learn more about these extra games. So I think this summer showcase as I feel like we've said multiple years in a row, it's going to be another really big one for them. This is the yeah. first one with Activision in the tuck. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, especially the the direct stuff. I would, I know I said I don't think it'll get it, but I would love selfishly for an avowed direct just because they need to show everything with that game. Like mm. they've been showing, I think, all the wrong things with the game. And I still think it's a delay candidate in my eyes. If you're shipping 10 games this year and avowed's looking how it was looking, you know, just saying, like, I'm like, okay. I think, you know, especially if a lot of them are coming out in the second half, I think you might be able to just shuffle the, shuffle shuffle the deck a little bit and, yeah. and lay out the cards a different way, uh, in Indiana my Jones. personal opinion. But I just feel they haven't showed enough quests, outcomes, character building, skill systems, companion interaction. Like, about has the stuff to show off, apparently. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I think that's a game that would greatly benefit from it because there's let's be honest, like from the initial showing, there's been a growing skepticism with this game. Yes, that's fair. And that would be, if they feel confident and they've polished things up enough, that would be good from a defensive point of view to right, right. reassure people of what this thing is. But yes, that's you. more of a selfish pick for me. I, I think it could fit in well. I hear, you. I hear where you're coming from. Otherwise, we'll talk more about the the Xbox showcase when we we get there, which is not too far away. So... We'll get to it then. But thank you, Dylan, for writing. And thank you, everyone else, for writing into what has been a really fun uh, patron focused episode yeah. of Defining Duke. Uh, this has definitely been one of the more enjoyable ones, you know, especially with no news. I was like, how are we going to do this episode? But here we are. Mm-hmm. Did a great yeah. job. So uh, thank you, everyone, for Salute. tuning in. Cog, Yo. we're here at the end. It's time yes. for our hashtag. What do we round it out with, sir? We don't round with the dokes. We had a lot, you know, about the industry. We had a lot about things going anyway. We had a lot. Well, no, else. Yeah. Um, talked about just gaming in general. Hmm. Um. Shout out there. We had some. We had some good topics. That was. Yeah, fun. we talked was about good. the future of gaming. We've kind of leaned into that a lot, so we should step away from that. We opened up with a really good health is wealth segment. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. We had. You know what I kind of want to do. 
Which window? We had a few this episode. We had your iconic one last week. I feel like the, the analogy. I feel like this is a okay. show defined by the analogies. By analogies, yeah, yeah. yeah we had a lot of them this week. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like that's one that that we got to kind of lean into for. Yeah, a let's week, lean right? into that. Let's All lean right. into that. I like that. DD analogy, ladies and gentlemen, you got this deep. Let us know. Uh, we're over on Twitter. I'm at G27 G27 status. Cog is at Lord Cognito. You can tag us there. Let us know your thoughts on the episode. Use the hashtag DD analogy. A lot of you've been doing that, by the way. Thank you. We see yeah, them all. I'm we like them all. We appreciate them all. Yeah. So thank you for interacting there. You don't have to go over on social media if you don't want to. You can use the comment section down below. Let us know your thoughts on the episode. Hashtag DD analogy. We're looking forward to seeing your thoughts. We appreciate you immensely. Thank you for your kind words as of late. And with that, Cog, any other mm-hmm. final closing thoughts? You were rudely interrupted last week by Colin. I don't know if you saw some of the write-ins, but I think there was an what? editing error. And so you were in the middle of this oh, yeah. speech about the realm of the Dukes, and you got cut off by Colin. And like, Yo. Defining Duke is brought to you by us. So, Cog, if there's anything you'd like to get off your chest, <laughs> hopefully there's no editing Colin staff. Don't want me to shine. He don't want me. He know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be coming for the crown. Go for the crown. <laughs> It's all good, man. Nah, it's all it's all good. And lo- as long as it's acknowledged, you know what I'm saying? I get that sometimes. They'd be like, yo, Cog, you didn't say that. I was like, bro, it was cut off. <laughs> like, oh, okay, okay. I always get this. You didn't push back enough. Oh, you didn't say yeah, it. Yeah, like, we hear that a lot. Unless I unless I physically assault Colin, I will forever have not push back on him enough about the subject. <laughs> we, have, we, we apparently lay on our backs for everything Colin does. Yeah, but, yeah clearly. Yeah, yeah. But, but so, mm-hmm. now you have the chance to really fight back Con. any fight any back. closing thoughts here as we wrap Listen, up man, salute to the realm of the dukes i've been liking what i've been seeing um yes just just in general with like the patreon comments and even the youtube car i'm like all right good vibes much, yeah yeah like i'm like i'm not used to this it's like mad good vibes now and like <laughs> yo i like when they talk about games and they having fun i'm like yeah. yo that's what the show generally is about right so it's like it, it, it's funny when you see certain people try to hijack when they just don't like one specific opinion but don't talk about the totality of the show. So yeah. what I'm seeing now is people like, nah, the show is fire. And they, they have a, and I love that. Not just to stroke yeah. my own ego. If you don't, you don't like something, but it's just like, I, I it's to me, that's the honest take of the final Duke. And when I see yeah. that, I'm like, okay, that's how I envisioned it. Minus, you know, one or two points that we may say that people disagree with, but yeah, yeah. Nah, it's super dope. So should, this goes back to the realm of the Dukes holding us down, having our backs and then we got, you know, for me, obviously, I got Sacred coming up, you know, the 300 coming up. You'll be yeah. missed, sir. You'll be missed. Yes, we'll, we'll I appreciate see. that. But, um, you know, I got to show some love. And obviously, IOP going to open up and stuff like that. So yes. a lot of people hit me up like, yo, can't wait to see you. But I should hopefully see you at PAX. That would be dope. You know yeah, what I'm saying? If I can see you for a little bit there. Because I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. Dude, like this, I know. We haven't set off 2024 since, now. Yeah, it's been since. Forza event, I'm going to yeah, say. Forza. Yeah, Forza. Yeah, Forza. I saw yeah. you after your whole ordeal. Yeah, I'm giving you a good, fresh. good hug, pat on yeah, the back. Yeah, I just yeah. came through it. That's right. Yeah. I was off the surgery of that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was a big one. I lost a lot of weight. I was really skinny at that point. I lost you a lot of weight. You were looking great, in my opinion. I was like, damn, if, if, if he didn't tell me the whole story, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> people did say, yeah, a lot of people said that too. So, yeah, very thankful. But, yeah, salute to everybody, man. This, yeah. this is fun. And let's get back to these games, y'all. Let's get back to yes, playing. Sir. I want to see picks is put, putting up picks and you playing and enjoying something. Instead of sir. analyzing every yeah, five sir. minutes about what somebody said, let's just have some fun. Let's get back to the I'm fun. I'm sure. Game. I'm sure with this week we sold like at least ten copies of Tekken. <laughs> oh, Tekken, bro! Damn, cool. I need to check. I need yeah. to check. I'm out here, man. Yeah. I'm doing the Lord's work. This right is a now. joint <laughs> effort this time, right? Because we at first you were just doing the Lord's work on Midnight Suns, right? Like, but now it's a joint effort on Tekken Eight, man. Like, we're gonna have like a defi- one. One of these days we'll do like a live defining Duke. I don't know when that'll come, and we'll have like a massive Tekken tournament. Oh, <laughs> bro, so it's got funny. to go down. <laughs> got to go down. That would be dope. And I'm seeing people say, "Yo, because of y'all." I'll pick that up. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try awesome. my first fighting game in a while. Salute. It's not going to end this episode. I still haven't played the story yet. So I'm sure that'll only, I know, I know, bro. I'm telling you, it's that we got to think of a name for it. It's that practice ranked practice cycle. Oh. Now, now you just brought in replay. Like, replay. Yeah. It's over for you bro. now. Yeah. Oh, you're going to so, get so much better. Trust yeah. me. You're gonna get so I'm so excited better. to try it out, man. Wait. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate you immensely. Again, if you need a reminder, hashtag DD analogy. Looking forward to seeing your thoughts in the comments, whether you're on Patreon, YouTube. Thank you so much. And uh, next week, I'm going to make a note here. We're going to make sure we read a lot of your mobile reviews. So if you want to submit any last minute ones, because it's been a while, uh, we'll do that. Thank you again for writing in. Catch you next time around with episode 166 of Defining Duke and Xbox podcast. Until then, peace out. 
Defining Duke, an Xbox podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded from the United States of America. The show is conceived by Matthew Mr. Matty Play Schroeder and me, Colin Moriarty, and is written and produced by Matthew Schroeder. Maddie's co-host is Barry Lord Cognito Eversley. Defining Duke's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Defining Duke, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level on Patreon, and we're thankful for your kindness and generosity. 